Beating the Street by Peter Lynch with John Rothschild. I turned off my Quotron at the Fidelity Magellan Fund on May 31st, 1990. This was exactly 13 years from the day I began running the fund. I figured I had purchased more than 15,000 stocks for investors in Magellan, and many of them more than once. No wonder I had gotten a reputation for never having met a share I didn't like. My departure was sudden, but it wasn't something I had dreamt up overnight. The task of keeping track of so many companies had begun to take its toll. As much as I enjoyed managing a portfolio the size of the GNP of Ecuador, I missed not being home to watch the children grow up. When you start to confuse Freddie Mac, Sally Mae, and Fannie Mae with members of your family, and you remember 2,000 stock symbols, or forget the children's birthdays, there's a good chance you've become too wrapped up in your work. By mid-1990, it finally dawned on me that the job had to go. I remember that my fund's namesake, Ferdinand Magellan, also retired early to a remote island in the Pacific. Although what happened to him afterwards, he was torn to shreds by angry natives, was enough to give me pause. Hoping to avoid a similar fate at the hands of angry shareholders, I met with Ned Johnson, my boss at Fidelity, along with Gary Burkhead, the director of operations, to discuss a smooth exit. Our powwow was straightforward and amicable. Ned Johnson suggested that I stay on as group leader for all the Fidelity equity funds. He offered to give me a smaller fund to operate, one, say, with $100 million in assets, as opposed to the $12 billion with which I had to cope. But even with a couple of the digits knocked off, it seemed to me the new fund would require the same amount of work as the old one, and I'd be back spending Saturdays at the office. I declined Ned's gracious invitation. I've always been skeptical of millionaires who congratulate themselves for walking away from a chance to enrich themselves further. Turning one's back on a fat future paycheck is a luxury that few people can afford. But if you're lucky enough to have been rewarded in life to the degree that I have, there comes a point at which you have to decide whether to become a slave to your net worth by devoting the rest of your life to increasing it or whether to let what you've accumulated begin to serve you. I've chosen the latter, but with an important qualification. I'm still a stock picker, even though I've rejoined the amateur ranks. I've picked up a few ideas about stocks over the years, some of which have been published previously. What inspires me to retake the pulpit is that a majority in the congregation continues to favor bonds. Obviously, they must have slept through my last sermon, one up on Wall Street, in which I tried to prove once and for all that putting money into stocks is far more profitable than putting it into bonds, certificates of deposit, or money market accounts. Otherwise, why are 90% of the nation's investment dollars still parked in these inferior spots? Throughout the 1980s, which was the second best decade for stocks in modern history, only the 50s was slightly more bountiful. The percentage of household assets invested in stocks declined. This percentage, in fact, has been declining steadily, from nearly 40% in the 1960s to 25% in 1980 to 17% in 1990. As the Dow Jones average and other stock indexes quadrupled in value, a mass of investors was switching out of stocks. Even assets invested in equity mutual funds shrunk from around 70% in 1980 to 43% in 1990. This calamity for the future of individual and national wealth cannot go unchallenged. Let me begin then where I left off the last time. If you hope to have more money tomorrow than you have today, you've got to put a chunk of your assets into stocks. Maybe we're going into a bear market and for the next two years or three years or even five years, you wish you never heard of stocks. But the 20th century is full of bear markets, not to mention recessions. In spite of that, the results are indisputable. 
sooner or later a portfolio of stocks or stock mutual funds will turn out to be a lot more valuable than a portfolio of bonds or CDs or money market funds. There, I've said it again. Let me tell you why I'm repeating myself. In exactly one decade out of the past seven, the 1930s, bonds have outperformed stocks. That means that the odds are 6 to 1 that a dedicated stock picker will do better than people who stick with bonds. Moreover, the gains enjoyed by the bondholders in the rare decade when bonds beat stocks cannot possibly hope to make up for the huge advantages made by stocks in periods such as the 1940s and the 1960s. Over a seven-decade span for the 1920s to the 1980s, a $100,000 investment in long-term government bonds would now be worth $1.6 million. The same amount invested in the Standard & Poor's 500 would be worth $25.5 million. This leads me to Peter's principle number one. Gentlemen who prefer bonds are making a big mistake. The debate over whether to invest in small stocks or big stocks or how to choose the best stock mutual fund is subordinate to the main point. Whichever way you do it, big stocks, small stocks, or medium-sized stocks, buy stocks. I'm assuming, of course, that you go about your stock picking and fund picking in an intelligent manner, and you don't get scared out in the corrections. A second reason I've taken on this project is to further encourage the amateur investor not to give up on the rewarding pastime of stock picking. I've said before that an amateur who devotes a small amount of study to companies in an industry he or she knows something about can outperform 75% of the paid experts who manage mutual funds, plus have fun in the process. Amateur stock picking is a dying art, like pie baking, which is losing out to packaged goods. A vast army of mutual fund managers is paid handsomely to do for portfolios what Sarah Lee did for cakes. I'm sorry this is happening. It bothered me when I was a fund manager, and it bothers me even more now that I have joined the ranks of the non-professionals, investing in my spare time. The main reason for the decline of the amateur stock picker has to be losses. It's human nature to keep doing something as long as it's pleasurable and you can succeed at it. That's why the world's population continues to increase at a rapid rate. If people have gotten out of stocks, it's because they're tired of losing money. It's easy to fail in the stock market. If you buy futures and options and attempt to time the market, you'll probably wind up getting all Fs, which must have happened to a lot of people who have fled to mutual funds. As stock picking disappears as a serious hobby, the techniques of how to evaluate a company, the earnings, the growth rates, and so forth, are being forgotten right along with the old family pie recipes. With fewer retail clients interested in such information, brokerage houses are less inclined to volunteer it. Analysts are too busy talking to the institutions to worry about educating the masses. Meanwhile, the brokerage house computers are busily collecting a wealth of useful information about companies that can be regurgitated in almost any form for any customer who asks. At Smith Barney, Albert Bernazzotti notes that his firm can provide 8 to 10 pages of financial information on most of the 2,800 companies in the Smith Barney universe. Merrill Lynch can do screens, computer-generated lists of companies that share basic characteristics on 10 different variables. The Value Line Investment Survey has a value screen, and Charles Schwab has an impressive data service called the Equalizer. Yet none of these services is in great demand. Tom Riley at Merrill Lynch reports that less than 5% of his customers take advantage of the stock screens. Jonathan Smith at Lehman Brothers says the average retail investor does not take advantage of 90% of what Lehman can offer. In prior decades, when more people bought their own stocks, the stock poker per se was a useful database. Many old-fashioned brokers were students of a particular industry or a particular handful of companies and could help teach clients the ins and outs. Brokers today have many things besides stocks to sell, including annuities, limited partnerships, tax shelters, insurance policies, CDs, bond funds, and stock funds. 
They have to understand all of these at least well enough to make the pitch. They have neither the time nor the inclination to track the utilities or the retailers or the auto sector. And since few clients are invested in individual stocks, there's little demand for stock picking advice. Anyway, the broker's biggest commissions are made elsewhere, on load mutual funds, underwritings, and in the options game. With fewer brokers offering personal guidance to fewer stock pickers, and with a climate that encourages capricious speculation with fun money, and an exaggerated reverence for professional skills, it's no wonder that so many people conclude that picking their own stocks is hopeless. But let me tell you about a remarkable exception to this conclusion, the St. Agnes portfolio. The 1990-1991 St. Agnes portfolio produced a 70% gain over a two-year period, outperforming the S&P 500 composite, which gained 26% in the same time frame, by a whopping margin. In the process, St. Agnes also outperformed 99% of all equity mutual funds, whose managers are paid considerable sums for their expert selections. The St. Agnes fund stock prickers were quite happy to settle for a free breakfast and a movie as their reward. You see, the St. Agnes portfolio was put together by a group of energetic 7th graders at St. Agnes School in Arlington, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Their teacher and CEO, Joan Morrissey, was inspired to test the theory that you don't need a Quotron or a Wharton MBA, or for that matter, even a driver's license to excel in equities. I was made aware of this fine performance when Miss Morrissey's class sent a large scrapbook to my office. The seventh graders not only listed their top rated selections, but drew pictures of each one. This leads me to Peter's principle number two. Never invest in any idea that you can't illustrate with a crayon. This rule ought to be adopted by many adult money managers, amateur and professional, who have habit of ignoring the understandably profitable enterprise in favor of the confusing venture that loses money. Surely it would have kept investors away from dense pack microsystems, the manufacture of memory modules, stock of which, alas, has fallen from $16 to 25 cents. Who could draw a picture of a dense pack microsystem? In order to congratulate the entire St. Agnes Fund Department, which doubles as Ms. Morrissey's social studies class, and also to learn the secrets of its success, I invited the group to lunch at Fidelity's executive dining room, where for the first time, pizza was served. There, Ms. Morrissey explained how her class is divided every year into teams of four students each, and how each team is funded with a theoretical $250,000, and then competes to see who can make the most of it. Each of the various teams, which have adopted nicknames such as Rags to Riches, The Wizards of Wall Street, Wall Street Women, The Money Machine, Stocks Are Us, and even The Lynch Mob, also picks a favorite stock to be included in the scrapbook, which is how the model portfolio is created. The students learn to read the financial newspapers, The Wall Street Journal, and Investors Daily. They come up with a list of potentially attractive companies and then research each one checking the earnings and the relative strength. Then they sit down and review the data and decide which stocks to choose. This is a similar procedure to the one that is followed by many Wall Street fund managers, although they aren't necessarily as adept at it as these kids. Ms. Morrissey told me that she tries to stress the idea that a portfolio should have at least 10 companies, with one or two providing a fairly good dividend. But before my students can put any stock in the portfolio, she told me, they have to explain exactly what the company does. If they can't tell the class the service it provides or the products it makes, then they aren't allowed to buy. Buying what you know about is one of our themes. Buying what you know about is a very sophisticated strategy that many professionals have neglected to put into practice. One of the companies that the students at St. Agnes know about, for example, was Pentec International, the maker of colored pens pencils, and markers. Their favorite Pentec product, with a marker on one end and a highlighter on the other, was introduced into the class by Miss Morrissey. This pen was very popular, and some of the kids even used it to highlight their stock selections. It wasn't long before they were investigating Pentec itself. The stock was selling for $5 at the time, and the students discovered that the company had no long-term debt. They were also impressed by the fact that Pentec made a superior product which judging by the popularity in-house 
was likely to be just as popular in classrooms nationwide. Another positive from their point of view was that Pentec was a relatively small unknown company as compared say to a Gillette, the maker of paper mate pens and the Good News Razor they saw in their father's bathrooms. Trying to come to the aid of a colleague, the St. Agnes fund managers sent me a Pentec pen and suggested I look at this wonderful company. This advice I wish I had taken. After I received the research tip and neglected to act on it, the stock nearly doubled from five and one eighth to a high of nine and a half. This same kid's eye approach to stock picking led the 1990 St. Agnes fund managers to Walt Disney Company, two sneaker manufacturers, Nike and LA Gear, The Gap, where most of them buy their clothes, PepsiCo, which they know four different ways by a Pepsi-Cola, Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Frito-Lay, and Topps, a maker of baseball cards. The only clunker in the St. Agnes portfolio is IBM, which I don't have to tell you has been the favorite of professional adult money managers for more than 20 years, yours truly included, and the grown-ups keep buying it and wishing they hadn't. The reason for this destructive obsession is not hard to find. IBM is an approved stock that everybody knows about, and a fund manager can't get into trouble for losing money on it. The St. Agnes kids can be forgiven this one foolish attempt to imitate their elders on Wall Street. After visiting Fidelity, eating pizza in the executive dining room, and giving me the Pentec advice I wish I had taken, the St. Agnes stock experts returned the favor by inviting me to address the school and to visit their portfolio department, also known as the classroom. In response to my visit to this 100-year-old institution, which offers classes from kindergarten through eighth grade, I received a cassette tape which the students had recorded. This remarkable tape includes some of their own stock picking ideas and stratagems, as well as a few that I'd suggested and they decided to repeat back to me, if only to make certain I wouldn't forget them myself. At the end of the tape, the entire seventh grade portfolio department repeated the following maxims in unison. This is a course that we should all memorize and repeat in the shower to save ourselves from making future mistakes. A good company usually increases its dividend every year. You can lose money in a very short time, but it takes a long time to make money. The stock market really isn't a gamble, as long as you pick good companies that you think will do well, and not just because of the stock price. You can make a lot of money from the stock market, but then again, you can also lose money, as we proved. You have to research the company before you put your money into it. When you invest in the stock market, you should always diversify. You should invest in several stocks because out of every five you pick, one will be very great, one will be really bad, and three will be okay. Never fall in love with a stock. Always have an open mind. You shouldn't just pick a stock. You should do your homework. Buying stocks in utility companies is good because it gives you a higher dividend but you'll make more money in gold stocks. Just because a stock goes down doesn't mean it can't go lower. Over the long term, it's better to buy stocks in small companies. You should not buy a stock because it's cheap, but because you know a lot about it. Ms. Morrissey continues to do her best to promote amateur stock picking, not only with students, but with her fellow teachers, whom she inspired to start their own investment club, the Wall Street Wonders. There are 25 members, including me. I'm honorary. The club has a decent record, but not as good as the students. Wait until I tell the other teachers, Ms. Morrissey said, after we had gone over their numbers, that the kids' stocks had done better than ours. Evidence that adults as well as children can beat the market averages with a disciplined approach to picking stocks comes from the National Association of Investment Clubs, based in Royal Oak, Michigan. This organization represents 8,000 stock picking clubs and publishes a guidebook and a monthly magazine to help them. The NAIC reports that 61.9% of its chapters have done as well as or better than the S&P 500 average over the chapter's entire history, which for most of them is 10 years or more. The key to the success of these investment clubs is that they invest in a regular timetable, which takes the guesswork out of whether the market is headed up or down, 
and does not allow for the impulse buying and impulse selling that spoil so many nest eggs. People who invest in stocks automatically, the same amount every month, through their retirement accounts or other types of pension plans, will profit from their discipline just as the clubs have. An individual might be scared out of stocks and later regret it, but in the clubs, nothing can be accomplished without a majority vote. Collective decision making is one of the principal reasons that club members tend to do better with the money they invest with the group than with the money they invest in their private accounts on the side. In 40 years of experience, the NAIC has learned many of the same lessons I learned at Magellan and that the St. Agnes students learned too. Since it's impossible to predict which companies will do better than expected and which will do worse, the organization advises that your portfolio should include no fewer than five stocks. The NAIC calls this the rule of five. The NAIC manual, which the directors kindly sent in to me at the office, contains several important maxims that can be added to the repertoire of the St. Agnes Chorus. These can be chanted as you mow the lawn, or better yet, recited just before you pick up the phone to call the stockbroker. Hold no more stocks than you can remain informed on. Invest regularly. You want to see first that sales and earnings per share are moving forward at an acceptable rate, and second, that you can buy the stock at a reasonable price. It's well to consider the financial strength and debt structure to see if a few bad years would hinder the company's long-term progress. Buy or do not buy the stock on the basis of whether or not the growth meets your objectives and whether the price is reasonable. Understanding the reasons for past sales growth will help you form a good judgment as to the likelihood of past growth rates continuing. The key to making money in stocks is not to get scared out of them. This point cannot be overemphasized. While catching up on the news is merely depressing to the citizen who has no stocks, it is a dangerous habit for the investor. Who wants to own shares in the gap if the AIDS virus is going to kill half the customers and the hole in the ozone the other half, either before or after the rainforest disappears and turns the Western Hemisphere into the new Gobi Desert, an event that will likely be preceded, if not followed, by the collapse of the remaining savings and loans, the cities, and the suburbs? You may never admit it to yourself. I decided to sell my gap shares because I read an article in the Sunday magazine about the effects of global warming, but that's the kind of weekend logic that's in force, sub rosa, when the sell orders come pouring in on Mondays. It's no accident that Mondays historically are the biggest down days in stocks, and the Decembers are often losing months, when the annual tax loss selling is combined with an extended holiday during which millions of people have extra time to consider the fate of the world. So I repeat, the best way not to be scared out of stocks is to buy them on a regular basis, month in and month out, which is what many people are doing in the 401k retirement plans and in their investment clubs, as mentioned before. It's no surprise that they've done better with this money than the money they move in and out of the market as they feel more and less confident. If you don't buy stocks with the discipline of adding so much money a month to your holdings, you've got to find some way to keep the faith. What sort of faith am I talking about? Faith that as old enterprises lose momentum and disappear, exciting new ones such as Walmart, Federal Express, and Apple Computer will merge to take their place. Faith that America is a nation of hardworking and inventive people, and that even yuppies have gotten a bad rap for being lazy. The even bigger picture is the one that's worth knowing about, if you expect to be able to keep the faith in stocks. The even bigger picture tells us that over the last 70 years, stocks have provided their owners with gains of 11% a year on average, whereas Treasury bills, bonds, and CDs have returned less than half that amount. In spite of all the great and minor calamities that have occurred in this century, all the thousands of reasons the world might be coming to an end, owning stocks has continued to be twice as rewarding as owning bonds. A decline in stocks is not a surprising event. It's a recurring event, as normal as frigid air in Minnesota. If you live in a cold climate, you expect freezing temperatures. So when outdoor temperatures drops below zero, you don't think of this as the beginning of the next ice age. 
you put on your parker, throw salt in the walk, and remind yourself that by summertime it will be warm outside. A successful stock picker has the same relationship with a drop in the market as a Minnesotan has with freezing weather. You know it's coming, and you're ready to ride it out. And when your favorite stocks go down with the rest, you jump at the chance to buy more. Mutual funds were supposed to take the confusion out of stock investing. No more worrying about which stocks to pick. Not anymore. Now you have to worry about which mutual fund to pick. There are 3,565 of them at recent count. We've got country funds and region funds, hedge funds and sector funds, value funds and growth funds, simple funds and hybrid funds, contrary funds, index funds, and even funds of funds. So, how can we begin to sort this muddle out? Two years ago, a group of wizened, as opposed to wise, investors in New England asked ourselves precisely that question. We'd been invited to help a nonprofit organization, which shall remain nameless, restructure its portfolio. The issues we confronted in advising this organization, how to redeploy its money, were the same as those faced by the average person who must figure out the same thing. First, we had to determine whether the mix of stocks and bonds in this organization's portfolio should be changed. This was an interesting exercise. No investment decision has greater consequence for a family's future net worth than the initial growth versus income decision. In my own family portfolio, I've had to become slightly more bond-oriented since I rely on investment income to make up for the absence of a salary but I'm still heavily invested in stocks. Most people err on the side of income and short-change growth. Today, approximately 75% of all mutual fund dollars is parked in a bond or money market fund. The growing popularity of bonds has been fortunate for the government, which has to sell an endless supply of them to finance the national debt. It is less fortunate for the future wealth of the bondholders, who ought to be in stocks. The reason that stocks do better than bonds is not hard to fathom. As companies grow larger and more profitable, their stockholders share in the increased profits. The dividends are raised. The dividend is such an important factor in the success of many stocks that you can hardly go wrong by making an entire portfolio of companies that have raised their dividends for 10 or 20 years in a row. Moody's Handbook of Dividend Achievers, 1991 edition, one of my favorite bedside thrillers lists such companies. Here's a simple way to succeed on Wall Street. Buy stocks from the Moody's list and stick with them as long as they stay on the list. A mutual fund run by Putnam, Putnam Dividend Growth, adheres to this follow the dividend strategy. Whereas companies routinely reward their shareholders with higher dividends, no company in the history of finance, going back as far as the Medici's, has rewarded its bondholders by raising the interest rate on a bond. The most a bondholder can expect is to get his or her principal back after its value has been shrunk by inflation. That said, my advice is to increase the stock part of the mix to the limit of your tolerance. I proposed as much to the directors of the nameless nonprofit organization. Before they decided to remodel the portfolio, the mix was 50% stocks and 50% bonds. Normally, bonds are held to maturity and redeemed for the original purchase price. So there was no potential for growth in that half of the portfolio. The stock portion, on the other hand, could be expected to increase in value at 8% a year above and beyond the dividend. With 50% of the money invested in stocks that grow at 8% and 50% in bonds that don't appreciate at all, the combined portfolio had a growth rate of 4%, barely enough to keep up with inflation. But what would happen if we adjusted the mix? By owning more stocks and fewer bonds, the organization would sacrifice some current income in the first few years. But this short-term sacrifice would be more than made up for by the long-term increase in the value of the stocks, as well as by the increases in the dividends from these stocks. Let me give you some examples of this. Here are some numbers that were crunched on my behalf 
by Bob Beckwith, who has turned in a winning performance at the Fidelity Asset Manager Fund, which he runs. We'll suppose that $10,000 is invested and that the bonds are paying 7% interest and the stocks are paying the current 3% dividend. For the purpose of this exercise, we'll assume that stocks appreciate at the historic average of the last 70 years of 8%, which of course includes the Great Depression. So let's sum up what happens to your $10,000 after 20 years in three different scenarios. If it's 100% invested in bonds, you will get a total return of $24,000. If it's 50% invested in bonds and 50% in stocks, the total return will be $39,200. If it's, however, 100% in stocks, the total return will be $60,300. I wish I had had Beckwith's numbers when I made my presentation to the nonprofit organization we've been talking about, because then I might have tried to talk them out of owning any bonds. At least we decided to increase the percentage of asset invested in stocks, which is a step in the right direction. The mix of assets having been decided, the next step is to figure out how to invest the bond portion. I'm no bond fan, which explains why this discussion is going to be short. Let me begin by saying something about bonds as a safe place to keep your money. They aren't. A 30-year Treasury bond that pays 8% interest is safe only if we have 30 years of low inflation. If inflation returns to double digits, the resale value of an 8% bond will fall by 20 to 30%, if not more. In such a case, if you sell the bond, you lose money. If you hold on to it for the entire 30 years, you're guaranteed to get your money back. But that money, the principal, will be worth only a fraction of what it's worth today. Unlike wine and baseball cards, money is cheapened with age. For example, the $1992 is worth one-third of its 1962 ancestor. I may lose some friends in the bond fund department for saying this, but their purpose in life eludes me. Anyone could just as easily buy a seven-year treasury bond, pay no fee, and get the identical interest rate. A study done by the New York bond dealer Gabrielle, Huglin, and Cashman concludes that in a six-year period from 1980 to 1986, bond funds were consistently outperformed by individual bonds, sometimes by as much as 2% a year. Another mystifying aspect of bond fund mania is why so many people are willing to pay an upfront sales charge, also known as a load, to get into government bond funds and the so-called Ginny May funds. It makes sense to pay the load on a stock fund that consistently beats the market. You'll get it back and then some in the fund's performance. But the performance of a non-load bond fund and funds with loads is almost identical. This leads us to Peter's principle number three. There's no point in paying Yo-Yo Ma to play a radio. So much for bond funds. Now let's consider stock funds. In one respect, a stock fund is no different from a stock. The only way to benefit from it is to keep owning it. People who can't tolerate seeing their mutual fund lose 20 to 30 percent of their value in short order certainly shouldn't be invested in growth funds or general equity funds. Perhaps they should choose a balanced fund that contains both stocks and bonds or an asset allocation fund, either of which offers a smoother ride than the ride you get on a pure growth stock fund. Of course, there's less reward at the end of the ride. Turning our attention to the baffling assortment of 1,127 equity funds on the market today, we arrive at Peter's principle number four. As long as you're picking a fund, you might as well pick a good one. This is easier said than done. Over the last decade, up to 75% of the equity funds have been worse than mediocre, failing to outgain the random basket of stocks that make up the market indexes, year in and year out. So should you forget about picking a managed fund from among the hundreds on the market, invest in an index fund or a couple of index funds, and be done with it? 
Well, if you extend your research to three decades, you find that the managed funds and the indexes are running neck and neck, with the managed funds having the slightest edge. All the time and effort that people devote to picking the right fund, the hot hand, the great manager, have in most cases led to no advantage. Unless you are fortunate enough to pick one of the few funds that consistently beat the averages, I'll say more of this later, your research came to naught. There's something to be said for the dartboard method of investing. Buy the whole dartboard. I have the same attitude about mutual funds as I have about stocks. You just never know where the next great opportunities will be, so it pays to be eclectic. If you own only one fund, you may find yourself stuck in a situation in which the managers have lost their touch and in which the stocks in the fund have gone out of favor. Here, of course, we get into the increasingly complex universe of types of funds. The most important basic types are as follows. One, capital appreciation funds, in which managers have leeway to buy any and all kinds of stocks and are not forced to adhere to any particular philosophy. Magellan is one of these. Two, value funds, in which the managers invest in companies of which the assets, not the current earnings, are the main attraction. Many of these so-called value companies have gone deep into debt to buy assets. They plan to reap the benefits later as the debts are paid off. Three, quality growth funds, in which the managers invest in medium-sized and large-sized companies that are well-established, expanding at a respectable and steady rate, and increase their earnings 15% a year or better. This cuts out the cyclicals, the slower growing blue chips, and the utilities. Four, emerging growth funds, in which managers invest mostly in small companies. These small cap stocks lagged the market for several years and suddenly came into their own in 1991. Five, special situation funds, in which managers invest in stocks of companies that have nothing in particular in common except that something unique has occurred to change their prospects. Knowing what kind of fund you have helps you make an informed judgment as to whether or not you should keep it. That Mario Gabelli's value fund had lagged the market for a couple years is not in itself a good reason for abandoning Gabelli. In fact, Gabelli's fund rebounded in 1992. When value stocks are out of favor, there's no way Gabelli or Kurt Lindner or Michael Price can be expected to perform as well as the manager of a growth fund that is in favor. The only fair point of comparison is one value fund versus another. Likewise, it would be silly to blame the manager of a gold fund that was down 10% in a year when gold stocks in general were down by the same 10%. When any fund does poorly, the natural temptation is to want to switch to a better fund. People who succumb to this temptation without considering the kind of fund that failed them are making a mistake. They tend to lose patience at precisely the wrong moment jumping from the value fund to a growth fund just as value is starting to wax and growth is starting to wane. Remember, patience and diversity. To increase the odds that at least some of the assets would be invested in the right place at the right time, we ended up picking 13 different funds and managers for our nonprofit organization. These include one value manager, two quality growth managers, two special situation funds, three capital appreciation funds, one emerging growth fund, a fund that invests only in companies that have consistently raised their dividends, and three convertible securities funds. If you're an average investor, you can duplicate this strategy in a simpler way by dividing your portfolio into, say, six parts and investing in one fund from each of the five fund types I've just mentioned, plus a utility fund or an equity and income fund for ballast in a stormy market. The simple approach is to divide up your money into six equal parts by six funds and be done with the exercise. With new money to invest, repeat the process. The more sophisticated approach is to adjust the weighting of the various funds, putting new money into sectors that have lagged the market. This you should do only with new money. So how do you know which sectors have lagged the market? One way is to compare indexes. The Standard & Poor's 500 index is dominated by corporate giants in the drug and food and other non-durable businesses. 
The Dow Jones average, on the other hand, is heavily weighted in cyclicals, while the NASDAQ and Russell 2000 represent smaller emerging growth enterprises, restaurant chains, technology companies, and so forth. By comparing a chart of the S&P 500 index with the chart of the Russell 2000 index going back 10 years, you can begin to see a pattern. In the five years prior to 1990, the emerging growth stocks turned in a dismal performance relative to the S&P 500, with the S&P up 115 percent, while the Russell 2000 was up only 48 percent. But emerging growth caught up with a vengeance in 1991, when the Russell index gained 62 percent in 12 months. Some emerging growth funds did even better than the Russell index, posting 70 or even 80 percent gains. Obviously, 1990 would have been a good year to add money to the emerging growth sector of your portfolio. You would have been inclined to do just that had you paid attention to the progress of the various indexes, as reported in Barron's, the Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. Another useful way to decide whether to put your money into the emerging growth sector or to invest in a larger S&P type fund is to follow the progress of the T. Rowe Price New Horizons Fund. New Horizons is a popular fund created in 1961 to invest in small companies. In fact, whenever a company gets too big, the managers at New Horizons remove it from the portfolio. This is as close as you can get to a barometer of what is happening to emerging growth stocks. Comparing the performance of this fund to the S&P 500 will easily show relative differences and point out buying opportunities. How do you choose a value fund, growth fund, or capital appreciation fund that will outdo its rivals? Most people look at past performance. They study the Lipper Guide, published in Barron's, or in any of a number of similar sources that track fund performance. They look at the record for the one-year, three-year, five-year, and beyond. This is another national pastime, reviewing the past performance of funds. Thousands of hours are devoted to it. Books and articles are written about it. Yet, with few exceptions, this turns out to be a waste of time. What if you had bought the funds with the best five and ten year performances and held on to them for five years? In the case of the best five year performers, you would have done no better than the S&P index. And in the case of the ten year performers, you have actually have ended up lagging the S&P by 0.61%. The lesson here is, don't spend a lot of time poring over the past performance charts. That's not to say you shouldn't pick a fund with a good long-term record. But it's better to stick with a steady and consistent performer than to move in and out of funds trying to catch the waves. Another major issue is what happens to a fund in a bear market. This too is a complicated subject. Some funds lose more than others, but gain more on the rebound. Some lose less and gain less, and some lose more and gain less. This last group is the one to avoid. One excellent source of information on this subject is the Forbes Honor Roll, published in that magazine every September. To make the Forbes list, a fund has to have some history behind it, two bull markets and at least two bear markets. Forbes grades each fund from A to F on how it is fared in both situations. It gives the name of the fund manager and how long he or she has held the post, the fund expenses, the P-E ratio, and the average annual return for 10 years. Getting on the Forbes honor roll is tough, which is what makes this a good place to shop for funds. You can hardly go wrong by choosing one with an A or B rating in both kinds of markets. Another matter that needs to be addressed is load versus no load. If you buy a fund that carries a load, translation sales commission, does that mean you're getting a better product? Not necessarily. Some funds charge a load, while other equally successful funds don't. If you plan to stick with a fund for several years, the 2 to 5 percent you paid to get into them will prove insignificant. In comparing the past performances of one managed fund against another, you can ignore the fees. A fund's annual return is calculated after fees and expenses are deducted, so they're automatically factored into the equation. Before we leave this subject, there are four other types of funds I'd like to discuss. Sector funds, convertible funds, closed-end funds, and country funds.
the best candidate for investing in sector funds is a person with special knowledge about a commodity or the near-term prospects for a certain kind of business. An investor who is bullish on an industry, oil for example, but had no time to study specific companies in the oil industry, could simply buy the oil and gas sector fund. If you're in the right sector at the right time, you can make a lot of money very fast, as investors in Fidelity Biotechnology discovered in 1991. The value of that sector fund increased by 99% in one year. But such profits can also disappear as quickly as they're made. Fidelity Biotech was down 21% through the first nine months of 92. Now consider convertible funds. This is an underrated way to enjoy the best of two worlds. The high performance of secondary and small cap stocks and the stability of bonds. Generally it is the smaller companies that issue convertible bonds which pay a lower rate of interest than regular bonds. Investors are willing to accept this lower rate of interest and return for the conversion feature, which allows them to exchange their convertible bonds for common stock at some specific conversion price. There are some pitfalls to investing in convertible bonds. This is one field that's best left to experts. The amateur investor can do well in one of the numerous convertible funds, which deserve more recognition than they get Today, a good convertible fund yields 7%, which is far better than the 3% dividend that you get from the average stock. The Putnam Convertible Income Growth Trust, to name one such fund, has a 20-year total return of 885%, which beats the S&P 500. Few managed funds can make such a claim, as we've already mentioned. At the nameless nonprofit organization, we invested in no fewer than three convertible funds because at the time convertibles seemed undervalued. How could we tell? Normally a regular corporate bond yields one and a half to two percent more than a convertible bond. When this spread widens it means convertibles are becoming overpriced and when it narrows the reverse is true. During the Saddam sell-off in October 1990 convertible bonds were actually yielding one percent more than regular bonds issued by the same companies. This was a rare opportunity to pick up convertibles at a favorable rate. Here's a good strategy for convertible investing. Buy into convertible funds when the spread between convertible and corporate bonds is narrow, say 2% or less, and cut back when the spread widens. Closed-end funds trade as stocks on all the major exchanges. The main difference between a closed-end fund and an open-end fund such as Magellan is that a closed-end fund is static. The number of shares stays exactly the same. A shareholder in a closed-end fund exits the fund by selling his or her shares to somebody else, the same as if he or she were selling a stock. An open-end fund is dynamic. When an investor buys in, new shares are created. When the investor sells out, his or her shares are retired or redeemed, and the fund shrinks by that amount. I've never seen a definitive study of whether closed-end funds as a group do better or worse than open-end funds. On casual inspection, neither kind has any particular advantage. Superior performers in both categories appear on the Forbes honor roll of mutual funds, which proves that it's possible to excel with either format. Many closed-end funds are popularly known as country funds. These enable us to invest in our favorite countries, a more romantic prospect than investing in companies. The best argument for country funds as long-term investments is that foreign economies are growing faster than the U.S. version, which causes their stock markets to advance at a faster rate than ours. In the last decade, this certainly has been the case. But to succeed in a country fund, you have to have patience and a contrarian's bent Country funds arouse a desire for instant gratification. They can be traps for weekend thinkers. A good example is the Germany Fund and its offshoot, the New Germany Fund, both of which were conceived as the Berlin Wall was coming down. As triumphant Berliners dance in the rubble of the wall, the price of the two Germany funds 
was up to 25% above the value of the underlying stocks. These funds were going up two points a day on nothing but a wing and a prayer for an economic boom. Six months later, when investors finally noticed the problems in this great German renaissance, euphoria turned to despair, and the Germany funds quickly sold off at a 20 to 25% discount to the value of the underlying stocks. They've been selling at a discount ever since. Clearly the best time to buy a country fund is when it's unpopular, and you can get it for a 20 to 25% discount. Sooner or later, Germany will have its renaissance, and patient investors who bought the Germany funds on the dips will be glad they did. There are many drawbacks to country funds. Fees and expenses are generally quite high. It's not enough that the companies in which the fund has invested have done well. The currency of the country in question has to remain strong relative to the dollar. Otherwise, your gains will all be lost in translation. The government can ruin the party with extra taxes or regulations that hurt business. The manager of the country fund has to do his or her homework. Just who is that manager? Is it someone who once visited this country and has a travel poster to prove it, or someone who has lived and worked there, has contacts in the major companies, and can follow their stories? I'd like to add my two cents to the U.S. versus the world debate. These days, it's fashionable to believe that foreign-made anything is superior to the domestic version. But from all my trips abroad, I've concluded that the U.S. still has the best companies and the best system for investing in them. Europe is filled with big conglomerates that are the equivalent to our blue chips. But Europe lacks the number of growth companies we have. Those that do exist tend to be overpriced. Information about foreign companies is sketchy and often misleading. Only in Britain is there a semblance of the careful coverage that the companies get on Wall Street. Earning estimates can be quite imaginative. We chide U.S. analysts for being wrong much of the time, but compared to European analysts, they're nearly infallible. All things considered, I'd rather be invested in a solid emerging growth stock mutual fund in the good old USA. So, to summarize our discussion of mutual fund strategies, Put as much of your money into stock funds as you can. Even if you need income, you'll be better off in the long run to own dividend-paying stocks and to occasionally dip into capital as an income substitute. If you must own government bonds, buy them outright from the Treasury and avoid the bond funds, in which you're paying management fees for nothing. Know what kind of stocks you own. When evaluating performance, compare apples to apples value funds to value funds, growth funds to growth funds, and so on. Don't blame a gold fund manager for failing to outperform a growth stock fund. It's best to divide your money among three to four types of stock funds, growth, value, emerging growth, and so forth. So you will always have some money invested in the most profitable sector of the market. When you add money to your portfolio, put it into the funds that are invested in the sector has lagged the market for several years. Trying to pick tomorrow's winning fund based on yesterday's performance is a difficult, if not futile, task. Concentrate on solid performers and stick with those. Constantly switching your money from one fund to another is an expensive habit that is harmful to your net worth. Finally, if you don't want to do your homework, over the long term, buying stock index funds is better than keeping your money in the bank or investing in bonds. A group of us investment seers meets every January to participate in a panel discussion sponsored by Barron's Magazine, which later publishes the transcript. In January of 1992, I recommended 21 stocks to the readers of Barron's. In making these selections, I took notes as I went along. With these notes in hand, I tried to analyze my stock picking habits in as much detail as possible. This includes both how to identify promising situations and how to go about researching them. The remainder of this program is taken from these notes. I'll go through a selection of these 21 picks 
and tell you as much as I can about how and why I picked them. Whenever I can identify an idea or pattern of what I take to be significant, I've turned it into another one of Peter's principles, like the four you've already endured. I ask your indulgence in the hope that these may eventually prove helpful in your own investing pursuits. Stock picking is both an art and a science, but too much of either is a dangerous thing. A person infatuated with measurement, who has his head stuck in the sand of the balance sheets, is not likely to succeed. If you could tell the future from a balance sheet, then mathematicians and accountants would be the richest people in the world by now. On the other hand, stock picking as an art can be equally unrewarding. By art, I mean the realm of intuition and passion and right brain electrolysis in which the artistic type prefers to dwell. As far as the artist is concerned, finding a winning investment is a matter of having a knack and following a hunch. People with a knack make money, people without it always lose. To study the subject is futile. Those who hold this viewpoint tend to prove its validity by neglecting to do research and playing the market, which results in more losses, which reinforce the idea that they're lacking in knack. My stock picking method, which involves elements of art and science, plus legwork, hasn't changed in 20 years. I have a Quotron, but not the newfangled workstation that many fund managers are using, which reports on what every analyst in the universe is saying about every company, draws elaborate technical charts, and for all I know, plays war games with the Pentagon and chess with Bobby Fischer. Professional investors are missing the point. They're scrambling to buy services like Bridge, Shark, Bloomberg, First Call, Market Watch, and Reuters to find out what all the other professional investors are doing when they ought to be spending more time at the mall. A pile of software isn't worth a damn if you haven't done your basic homework on the companies. Trust me, Warren Buffett doesn't use this stuff. I've always believed that searching for companies is like looking for grubs under rocks. If you turn over 10 rocks, you'll likely find one grub. If you turn over 20 rocks, you'll find two. It only takes a couple of big winners in a decade to make the effort worthwhile. The smallest investor can follow the rule of five and limit the portfolio to five issues. If just one of those is a 10-bagger and the other four combined go nowhere, you've still tripled your money. By the time the Barron's Roundtable convened in January 1992, stocks in the Dow had enjoyed a great rise to a year-end high of 3,200, and optimism abounded. In the festive atmosphere that surrounded a recent 300-point gain in the Dow in just three weeks, I was the most depressed person on the panel. I'm always more depressed by an overpriced market where many stocks are hitting new highs every day than by a beaten-down market in a recession. Recessions, I figure, will always end sooner or later. And in a beaten down market, there are bargains everywhere you look. But in an overpriced market, it's hard to find anything worth buying. Ergo, the devoted stock picker is happier when the market drops 300 points than when it rises the same amount. Many of the larger stocks, especially the high profile growth companies such as Philip Morris, Abbott, Walmart, and Bristol Myers, had risen in price to the point that they had strayed far above their earnings lines. This was a bad sign. Stocks that are priced higher than their earnings lines have a regular habit of moving sideways, also known as taking a breather, or falling in price until they are brought back to more reasonable valuations. A glance at the charts led me to suspect that the much ballyhooed growth stocks that were the champions of 1991 would do nothing or go sideways in 1992, even in a good market. In a bad market, they could suffer 30% declines. There's no quicker or better way to tell if a large growth stock is overvalued, undervalued, or fairly priced than by looking in a chart book, available in libraries or at a broker's office. Buy shares when the stock price is at or below the earnings line, and not when the price line diverges into a danger zone, way above the earnings line. Small stocks, cyclicals, and savings and loans are where I expected to find the bargains in 1992. But before beginning to explore the small stock universe, I turned my attention to the companies I'd recommended 
to Barron's readers in 1991. This brings me to Peter's principle number five. The best stock to buy you may already own. Don't pick a new and different company just to give yourself another quote to look up in the newspaper. Otherwise, you will end up with too many stocks and you won't remember why you bought any of them. Getting involved with a manageable number of companies and confining your buying and selling to these is not a bad strategy. Once you've bought a stock, then presumably you've learned something about the industry and the company's place within it, how it behaves in recessions, what factors affect the earnings, and so forth. Inevitably, some gloomy scenario will cause a general retreat in the stock market, and these old favorites will once again become bargains, and you can add to your investment. The more common practice of buying, selling, and forgetting a long string of companies is not likely to succeed. Yet many investors continue to do this. They want to put their old stocks out of their minds because an old stock evokes a painful memory. If they didn't lose money on it by selling too late, then they lost money on it by selling too soon. Either way, it's something to forget. With a stock you've once owned, especially one that's gone up since you sold it, it's human nature to avoid looking at the quote on the business page, the way you might sneak around the aisle to avoid meeting an old flame in a supermarket. I know people will read the stock tables with their fingers over their eyes to protect themselves from the emotional shock of seeing that Walmart has doubled since they sold it. People have to train themselves to overcome this phobia. I've learned to think of investments not as disconnected events, but as continuing sagas, which need to be rechecked from time to time for the new twists and turns in the plot. Unless a company goes bankrupt, the story is never over. A stock you might have owned 10 years ago or two years ago may be worth buying again. To keep up with my old favorites, I carry a large, wire-bound, campus-style notebook, a sort of Boswell's Life of Johnson & Johnson, in which I record important details from the quarterly and the end reports, plus the reasons that I bought or sold the stock the last time around. On the way to the office or at home late at night, I thumb through these notebooks, as other people thumb through love letters found in the attic. So in preparation for the Barron's panel, I reviewed the 21 selections I made in 1991. It was a mixed bag that did extremely well in a year that the market at large enjoyed a broad-based rally. The S&P rose 30 percent. I think my recommendations were up 60 to 80 percent. I perused my diaries and noted several important changes. Mostly the prices had gone up. This wasn't necessarily enough of a reason not to repeat a recommendation, but in most cases it meant that the stock had ceased to be a bargain. One such stock was Cedar Fair, which owns amusement parks in Ohio and Minnesota. What had brought Cedar Fair to my attention in 1991 was that the stock had a high yield, 11%. It was selling for less than $12 then. A year later it was selling for $18, and at that price the yield was reduced to 8.5%. It was still a nice yield, but not nice enough to cause me to want to put more money into Cedar Fair. I needed some indication that earnings would improve, and from what I could gather in a chat with the company, there was nothing in the works that would provide such a boost. So I figured there were better opportunities elsewhere. At mid-year when I reviewed all of my stocks, I noticed things had changed dramatically at Cedar Fair. At the end of this tape, I will go through the details of this dramatic change that really made a great opportunity for investors. I went through the same drill with the other 20 companies I recommended the year before. EQK Green Acres I rejected because of a passing reference in its latest quarterly report. I've always found it useful to pay attention to the text in these little brochures. What caught my eye with this company, which owns a Long Island shopping center, was the fact they were debating whether or not to raise their quarterly dividend, which was customary. Green Acres had raised its dividend every quarter since it went public six years before. So to break the string to save $100,000, I took as evidence of short-term desperation. When a company that has a tradition of raising the dividend mentions in public that it might discontinue the practice for the sake of paltry savings, it's a warning that ought to be heeded. In July of 1992, EQK Green Acres not only didn't raise the dividend, it cut it drastically. 
Coca-Cola Enterprises had gone down in price, but this bottler's prospects were gloomier than before, so I rejected it. Fannie Mae had gone up in price, but its prospects were excellent, so I put it back on my list for the seventh year in a row. Just because a stock is cheaper than before is no reason to buy it. Just because it's more expensive is no reason to sell. After examining my previous year's selections and finding five that might be worth recommending again, I began my search for new selections in the usual fashion. I headed straight for my favorite source of investment ideas, the Burlington Mall. The Burlington Mall is located 25 miles from my home of Marblehead. It's a huge covered variety of which there are only about 450 or so in the United States. It's a delightful atmosphere in which to study great stocks. Public companies on the way up, on the way down, on the way out, or turning themselves around can be investigated any day of the week by both amateur and professional stock shoppers. As an investment strategy, hanging out at the mall is far superior to taking a stockbroker's advice on faith or combing the financial press for the latest tips. Many of the biggest gainers of all time come from the places that millions of consumers visit all the time. An investment of only $10,000 made in 1986 in each of the four popular retail enterprises, Home Depot, The Limited, The Gap, and Walmart stores, and held for five years, was worth more than $500,000 at the end of 1991. The inside of the Burlington Mall reminds me of an old town square, complete with ponds and park benches and large trees and a promenade of love-struck teenagers and the elderly. Instead of one movie theater facing the park, there's a fourplex down the corridor. Instead of a drugstore and a hardware store and a five and dime, there's 160 separate enterprises on two floors of commercial space where people can browse. But I don't think of it as browsing. I think of it as fundamental analysis on the intriguing lineup of potential investments arranged side by side for the convenience of stock shoppers. Here are more likely prospects than you could uncover in a month of investment conferences. That the Burlington Mall lacks a brokerage office is too bad, because otherwise it would be possible to sit here all day and check the traffic in and out of the various stores, then shuffle down to the broker to put in your buy orders on the ones that are the most crowded. This technique is far from foolproof, but I put it far ahead of buying stocks because Uncle Harry likes them, which brings us to Peter's principle number six. If you like the store, chances are you'll love the stock. The very homogeneity of taste in food and fashion that makes for dull culture also makes fortunes for owners of retail companies and restaurant companies. What sells in one town is almost guaranteed to sell in another, as it has with donuts, soft drinks, hamburgers, videos, nursing home policies, socks, pants, dresses, gardening tools, yogurt, and funeral arrangements. The stock picker who got in on the westward hoe of Home Depot, which began in Atlanta, or the eastward hoe of Taco Bell, which began in California, or the southward hoe of Land's End, which began in Wisconsin, or the northward hoe with Walmart, which began in Arkansas, or the coastward hoe of the Gap, or the Limited, both of which started in the Midwest, ended up with enough money to be able to travel the world and get away from the malls and the chain stores. I've been partial to retailers since I was introduced to Levitt's Furniture early in its 100-fold rise, an experience I never forgot. These companies don't always succeed, but at least it's easy to monitor their progress, which is another attractive quality they have. You can wait for a chain of stores to prove itself in one area, then take its show on the road and prove itself in several different areas before you invest. Employees at the malls have an insider's edge since they see what's going on every day, plus they get the word from their colleagues as to which stores are thriving and which are not. The managers of malls have the greatest advantage of all, access to monthly sales figures that are used to compute the rents. Any store operator who didn't buy the shares in the Gap or the Limited, knowing firsthand the profits these companies are making month after month, should be swaddled in ticker tape and set on a dunce stool in the window of the local Charles Schwab office. Even Ivan Boski never got better tips than these. 
and he cheated. The Lynch family has no relatives or mall operators. Otherwise, I'd be inviting them over for dinner three or four times a week. But we do have shoppers, which is the next best thing. My wife Carolyn does not do as much research at the register as she once did, but our three daughters have more than made up for her absence. Just before Christmas, I took my three daughters to Burlington for what was billed as a Christmas present trip for them. But for me, it was more of a research trip. I wanted them to lead me to their favorite stores, which based on past experience, was as infallible a buy signal as you could hope to find. The gap was crowded, as usual, but that's not where we headed first. They headed to the body shop. The body shop sells lotions and bath oil made from bananas, nuts, and berries. It sells beeswax mascara, kiwi fruit lip balm, orchid oil cleansing milk, honey and oatmeal scrub mask, seaweed and birch shampoo, and something even more mysterious called Rasool Mud Shampoo. Rasool Mud Shampoo is not something I'd normally put on my shopping list, but obviously a lot of other people would because the store was clogged with buyers. In fact, the body shop was one of the three most crowded stores in the entire mall, along with the Gap and the Nature Company, owned by CML, which also owns the popular Nordic tracks that now sit in people's living rooms. By my rough calculation, the body shop and the nature company together occupied 3,000 square feet, but they appeared to be doing as much business as Sears, which has over 100,000 square feet of selling space and looked almost empty. The body shop appeared to be well managed with a young and enthusiastic sales force of at least a dozen people. We left with several bags of shampoos and body soaps, the ingredients of which would have made an impressive salad. Back at the office, I looked up the body shop on my master printout of stocks that Magellan owned on the day of my departure, a printout that was twice as long as my hometown telephone directory. There, to my chagrin, I saw that I had bought shares in this company in 1989 and somehow had forgotten the fact. The body shop was one of those many tune in later stocks that I had purchased in order to keep track of future developments which in this case, I obviously neglected to do. Before I'd seen it on the mall, you could have told me the body shop was an auto repair franchise. I would have believed it. Through the analyst reports from a couple of brokerage firms, I got caught up on the story. This was a British company started by an ambitious housewife, Anita Roddick, whose husband was frequently out of town on business. Instead of watching the soap operas or taking aerobic exercises, she began tinkering with potions in her garage. Her potions were so popular that she began to sell them in the neighborhood, and this backyard enterprise soon developed into a serious business that went public in 1984 for five pence, roughly 10 cents a share. From its modest beginning, the body shop was soon transformed into an international network of franchises devoted to applying fruits and salads to the entire body. In spite of two big landmines, the stock lost half its value in the Great Correction of 1987 and again in the Saddam sell-off in 1990. In six years, the five pence issue had turned into 362 pence, more than a 70-fold return on investment for the lucky friends of the founders who bought on the initial offering. The body shop trades on the London Stock Exchange, but also can be bought and sold through most U.S. brokers. This is a socially conscious enterprise like Celestial Seasons or Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. It relies on natural ingredients, shuns advertising, gives all employees one day of paid leave per week for community service activities, promotes health instead of beauty. After all, how many of us will ever be beautiful? Recycles its shopping bags and pays a 25 cent reward for every little lotion bottle that's returned for a refill. The body shop's commitment to something other than money has not inhibited the franchise from making plenty of it. I was told that franchise owners can expect to turn a profit in the first year. In spite of the recession, body shops worldwide reported an increase in same-store sales in 1991. Same-store sales is one of the two or three key factors in analyzing a retail operation. The body shop products were priced above the shampoos and lotions sold in discount stores but slightly below those sold in specialty and department stores. This gave the company a price niche. 
The best part of the story was that the expansion was in the early stages and the idea seemed to have worldwide appeal. The country with the most body shops per capita was Canada, with 92 outlets open for business. Already the body shop had become one of the most profitable of all Canadian retailers in sales per square foot. There was only one body shop in Japan, one in Germany, and 70 in the U.S. It seemed to me that if Canada, with one-tenth of the U.S. population, could support 92 body shops, the U.S. could support at least 920. With years of growth ahead of it, the company was proceeding carefully and expanding with caution. You want to avoid the retailers that expand too fast, especially if they're doing it on borrowed money. Since the body shop was a franchise operation, it was able to expand on the franchisee's money. Same store sales were okay, the expansion plan seemed realistic, the balance sheet was strong, and the company was growing at 20 to 30 percent per year. What was wrong with this story? The P ratio of 42, based on broker adjustments of 1992 expected earnings. Any growth stock that sells for 40 times its earnings is dangerously high priced, and in most cases extravagant. As a rule of thumb, a stock should sell at or below its growth rate. That is the rate at which it increases its earnings each year. Even the fastest growing companies can rarely achieve more than the 25% growth rate, and a 40% growth rate is a rarity. Such rapid progress cannot long be sustained, and companies that grow too fast tend to self-destruct. Two analysts who followed the body shop were predicting that the company would continue to grow at a 30% rate in the next couple of years. So here was possibly a 30% grower selling at 40 times earnings. In the abstract, these were not attractive numbers. From the perspective of the current stock market, they didn't look quite as bad. At the time I was researching the company, the P-E ratio of the entire S&P 500 was 23, and Coca-Cola had a P-E of 30. If it came down to a choice between owning Coca-Cola, a 15% grower selling at 30 times earnings, or the body shop, a 30% grower selling at 40 times earnings, I preferred the latter. A company with a high P.E. that's growing at a fast rate will eventually outperform one with a lower P.E. that's growing at a slower rate. The key question was whether the body shop could actually keep up a 25 to 30 percent growth rate long enough for the stock to catch up to its lofty current price. This is easier said than done, but I was impressed with the company's proven ability to move into new markets and its worldwide popularity. This was an international enterprise almost from the start. The company installed itself in six continents and had hardly scratched the surface of any of them. If all goes according to plan, we could eventually see thousands of body shops and the stock might increase another 7,000%. It was the unique global aspect of this company that inspired me to make it one of my picks and barons. I wouldn't have touted it as the only stock a person should own, and I was aware that the high price relative to earnings left little room for error. The best way to handle a situation where you love the company but not the current price is to make a small commitment then increase it in the next sell-off. This was to happen in a big way in the final half of 1992. The most fascinating part of any of these fast-growing retailing stories, whether it's the body shop, Walmart, or Toys R Us, is how long you have to catch on to them. You don't have to rush in and buy shares while the inventor of the body shop lotions is still testing the original potion in her garage. You don't have to buy shares when 100 body shops have been open in England, or even when three or 400 have been open worldwide. Eight years after the public offering, when my daughters led me into the Burlington store, it was still not too late to capitalize on an idea that clearly had not yet run its course. If anybody ever told you that a stock that's already gone up tenfold or fiftyfold cannot possibly go higher, Show them the Walmart chain. 23 years ago, in 1970, Walmart went public with 38 stores, most of them in Arkansas. Five years after the initial offering, in 1975, Walmart had 104 stores, and the stock price had quadrupled. Ten years after the initial offering, in 1980, Walmart had 276 stores, and the stock was up nearly 20-fold. Many lucky residents in Bentonville, Arkansas, the hometown of Walmart's founder, the recently deceased Sam Walton, invested at the earliest opportunity and made 20 times their money 
in the first decade. Was it time to sell and not be greedy and put the money into computer stocks? No, not if you believe in making a profit. A stock doesn't care who owns it. And questions of greed are best resolved in church or in the psychiatrist's office and not in the retirement account. The most important issue to analyze was not whether Walmart stock would punish the greed of its shareholders, but whether the company had saturated its market. The answer was simple. Even in the 1970s, after all the gains in the stock and in the earnings, there was Walmarts in only about 15% of the country. That left 85% in which the company could still grow. You could have bought Walmart stock in 1980, a decade after it came public, and after the 20-fold gain which was already achieved, and after Sam Walton had become famous as the billionaire who drove a pickup truck. If you held the stock from 1980 through 1990, you would have made 30-fold on your money. And in 1991, you would have made another 60% on your money in Walmart, giving you a 50-bagger in 11 years. The patient original shareholders have that to feel greedy about, on top of the original 20-fold gain. They also have no problem paying the psychiatrists. In a retail company or a restaurant chain, the growth that propels earnings and stock price comes mainly from expansion. As long as the same source sales are on the increase, these numbers are shown in the annual and quarterly reports, and the company is not crippled by excessive debt, and it's following its expansion plans as described to shareholders in its reports, it usually pays to stick with the stock. As I've already mentioned, too often people buy stocks in response to good news and sell in response to bad news. That's their loss. It could be your gain. Prospecting in bad news is a technique that has led me to some great buys. I'll tell you about a few of them. Pier 1, Sunbelt Nurseries, and General Host, all of which I found as a result of an alleged collapse in real estate. As 1991 came to a close, the most fearsome places for stock pickers were all connected to housing and real estate. The famous collapse of commercial real estate was rumored to be spreading into residential real estate, where house prices were said to be plummeting so fast that sellers would soon be giving their deeds away. I saw this despair from my own neighborhood in Marblehead, where so many for sale signs had sprouted up, you would have thought the for sale sign was the new state flower of Massachusetts. The signs eventually disappeared as the frustrated sellers got tired of waiting for a decent offer. There was plenty of circumstantial evidence if you lived in a fat cat environment, that the great boom in real estate had gone bust. Since the owners of fat cat houses included newspaper editors, TV commentators, and Wall Street money managers, it's not hard to figure out why the collapse in real estate got so much attention on the front pages and the nightly news. Many of these stories had to do with the collapse in commercial real estate, but the word commercial was left out of the headlines, giving the impression that all real estate would soon be worthless. What caught my eye on the back pages one day was a tidbit from the National Association of Realtors. The price of the median house was going up. It had gone up in 89, it had gone up in 1990, and it was up again in 1991, as it had every year since the organization started gathering data in 1968. The price of the median house is only one example of the many quiet facts that can be a great source of strength and consolation for investors willing to explore in the scariest areas of the market. Other useful quiet facts are the affordability index from the National Association of Home Builders and the percentage of mortgage loans in default. I found on several occasions over the years the quiet facts told a much different story than the ones being trumpeted. A technique that works repeatedly is to wait until the prevailing opinion about a certain industry is that things have gone from bad to worse and then buy shares in the strongest companies in the group. Mind you, this technique is not foolproof. In the oil and gas drilling industries, people were saying things could not get any worse in 1984. They've been getting worse ever since. It's senseless to invest in a downtrodden enterprise unless the quiet facts tell you that conditions will improve, or they're improving already. The news about the price of the median house having gone up in 1990 
and again in 91, was so poorly disseminated that when I brought it up at the Barron's panel, nobody seemed to believe me. Moreover, the decline in interest rates had made houses more affordable than they had been in over a decade. The affordability index was so favorable that unless the recession was going to last forever, a better housing market seemed inevitable. Yet while the quiet facts pointed in a positive direction, many influential people were still worrying about the collapse in real estate and the prices of stocks in any enterprise remotely related to home building and home finance reflected their pessimistic view. In October 1991, I looked up Toll Brothers, a well-known building company that has appeared from time to time in my portfolio and in my diaries. Sure enough, Toll Brothers stock had dropped from 12 and 5 eighths to 2 and 3 eighths, a five bagger in reverse. A lot of the sellers must have owned fat cat houses. I chose Toll Brothers for further study because I remembered it as a strong company with a financial wherewithal to survive hard times. Ken Hebner, a fine fund manager who I had known for a long time, who recommended Toll Brothers to me years earlier, had told what a classy operation this was. Alan Leifer, a Fidelity colleague, also mentioned it to me in an elevator. Toll was strictly a home builder and not a developer, so it wasn't risking its own money by speculating in land and real estate. With many of its poorly capitalized competitors going out of business, I figured Toll Brothers would end up capturing more of the home building market after the recession. In the long run, the latest slump would be very good for toll. So what was wrong with this picture that would have justified a five-fold decrease in the value of Toll Brothers shares? I read the recent reports to find out. Debt had fallen by $28 million and cash was up by $22 million. So the balance sheet had improved during these hard times. So had the order book. Toll Brothers had a two-year backlog of orders for new homes. If anything, the company had too much business. The company had expanded to several new markets and was well positioned to benefit from a recovery. You don't need a terrific housing market for Toll to post record earnings. You can imagine my excitement at finding a company with very little debt and enough new orders to keep it busy for two years, its competitors dropping by the wayside, and its stock selling for one-fifth its 1991 high. I put Toll Brothers at the top of my Barron's list in October, expecting to recommend it at the panel in January. But in the meantime, the stock quadrupled to $8. By the time the panel convened, it had reached $12 again. Here's a tip for the prospectors of the year-end anomalies. Act quickly. It doesn't take long for the bargain hunters to find the bargains in the stock market these days. And by the time they've finished buying, these stocks aren't bargains anymore. Obviously, I wasn't the only investor who discovered the Toll Brothers bargain in the fall of 91. Frustrated that others were screaming their Eurekas before I had a chance to mention in print, I turned my attention to other companies that I imagined would benefit in subtler ways from the overblown crisis in real estate. The first that came to mind was Pier 1. It didn't take a clairvoyant to figure out that people who moved into houses they bought, new or used, were going to need lamps and room dividers, placemats and dish racks, rugs and shades and knickknacks, and maybe a few rattan couches and chairs. Pier 1 sold all of these items at prices that customers on a budget could afford. Naturally, I owned Pier 1 in Magellan. It was spun out of Tandy in 1966, and the virtue of this home furnishings outlet with a Far East flavor were pointed out to me by my wife, Carolyn, who enjoyed browsing through the Pier 1 located on the outskirts of the North Shore Shopping Center. This was a great growth stock in the 1970s that ran out of steam, then had another great run in the 80s. Investors who bought these shares during Pier 1's latest renaissance were well rewarded until the Great Correction of 1987, when the stock price dropped from $14 to $4. After that, it bounced back to $12, where it remained until the Saddam sell-off in 1990, when it was struck again, down to $3. When it came to my attention for the third time, the stock had rallied all the way to $10 and faded back to $7. At $7, I figured it might be undervalued, especially light of a probable recovery in housing. 
I opened up my Pier 1 imports file to refresh my memory. The company had 12 years of record earnings before it got hurt in the recession. At one point, a conglomerate called Intermark had owned 58% of the stock and prized it so highly it allegedly rejected an outside offer to sell these shares for $16 each. The story on Wall Street was that Intermark was holding out for $20, but later on, when Intermark was strapped for cash, was forced to sell all of its Pier 1 Imports shares for $7. Subsequently, Intermark went bankrupt. Getting the huge overhang of Intermark shares out of the way was a promising development. I talked to Pier 1's CEO, Clark Johnson, in late September of 1991, and again on January 8, 1992. He brought up several favorable factors. One, the company had made money in 1991 in a very difficult environment. Two, it was expanding at the rate of 25 to 40 new stores a year. And three, with only 500 stores in the U.S., it was nowhere close to saturating the market. The company also had managed to reduce expenses in spite of it having added 25 stores in 1991. Thanks to Pier 1's devotion to cost cutting, the profit margins had continued to improve. As for the old reliable indicator, same store sales, Mr. Johnson reported that in regions hardest hit by the recession, the sales were down 9%. From the rest of the country, they had increased. In a recession, it's not unusual for same store sales to decline. So I took this report as a modest positive. I'd be more worried if the same store sales had declined in a period of general prosperity for retailers, which this was not. Whenever I'm evaluating a retail enterprise, in addition to the factors we've already discussed, I always try to look at inventories. When inventories increase beyond normal levels, it's a warning sign that management may be trying to cover up the problem of poor sales. Eventually, the company will be forced to mark down the unsold merchandise and admit to its problem. At Pier 1, the inventories had increased, but only because the company had to fill the shelves in the 25 new stores. Otherwise, they stood at acceptable levels. Here was a fast grower with plenty of room to grow more. It was cutting costs, improving profit margins, and making money in a bad year. It had raised its dividend five years in a row, and it was perfectly positioned in a part of the market that was bound to get better, housing. Plus, a lot of Carolyn's friends are very fond of Pier 1. The bonus in the story was Sunbelt Nurseries. In 1991, Pier 1 had sold 51% of its Sunbelt nursery chain in a public offering. Of the proceeds of $31 million, $21 million was used to reduce the company's debt, and the other $10 million was returned to Sunbelt to help finance Sunbelt's renovation and expansion. Overall, Pier 1's debt was reduced by $80 million in 1991 to about $100 million. A stronger balance sheet made it very unlikely that Pier 1 would be going out of business anytime soon, which is what frequently happens to more heavily indebted retailers during recessions. The $31 million that Pier 1 received from selling half of Sunbelt was $6 million more than it had paid to acquire all of Sunbelt in 1990. You had to figure that the other half of Sunbelt retained by Pier 1 imports was also worth $31 million, which represented a valuable hidden asset to the company. At the time I was looking into all this, Pier 1 stock was selling for $7 with a P.E. ratio of 10 based on earnings estimates of $0.70 a share for 1992. With the company growing at 15% annual rate, the P.E. of 10 was a promising number. When I flew to New York in January to meet with a panel, the stock price had risen to 7 and 3 quarters. Still, I regarded it as a good buy, both on its own merit and because of the Sunbelt kicker. Every month, a few more of Pier 1 Imports, biggest competitors in home furnishings, mostly local mom and pops, were closing their doors and going out of business. Major department stores were dropping their home furnishings sections to concentrate on clothes and fashion accessories. When the economy turns around, Pier 1 will have a huge share of market in which no one else seems to want to compete. Perhaps I'm a frustrated matchmaker. Whenever I get interested in a company, I try to imagine 
what other company might want to acquire it. In my daydreams, I imagine that Pier 1 would be a logical acquisition candidate for Kmart, which was moderately pleased with its early acquisition of a drug chain, a book chain, an office supply chain, and is always looking for new ways to expand. About 10 seconds after putting away the Pier 1 file, I pulled out Sunbelt Nurseries. Often one stock leads to another, and the devoted stock picker is sent off on a new path, the way the trained hound follows his nose and picks up a new scent. Sunbelt is in the retail lawn and garden business. It occurred to me that the lawn and garden business would benefit from a rebound in housing just as much as the lampshade and dish rack business. Every new dwelling was going to need trees, shrubs, window box flowers, etc. to enhance its appearance. It also occurred to me as I pondered this further that the nursery business was one of the last mom and pop enterprises that had not been supplanted by franchises or chain stores. In theory, it was a great opportunity for a well-managed regional or national nursery chain to do to flower beds what Dunkin' Donuts had done for the donut. Could Sunbelt become that national chain? Operating as Wolf's Nurseries in Texas and Oklahoma, Nursery Land Garden Centers in California, and Tip Top Nursery in the Arizona region, Sunbelt already had established itself in six of the 11 largest lawn and garden markets in the U.S. According to a Smith Barney research report that found its way to my desk, the company was trying to cater to the upscale, quality conscious lawn and garden customer seeking a broader range and quality of plants and supplies as well as a higher level of service than is generally associated with discount oriented retailers. Originally Sunbelt was spun out of Tandy along with Pier 1 Imports. My first introduction to the independent entity came in August 1991 when Sunbelt Management visited Boston in a road show to sell some of the 3.2 million shares that Pier 1 was putting into the market. At this meeting, I picked up a copy of the prospectus. Reading a prospectus is like reading the fine print on the back of an airline ticket. Most of it is boring, except for the exciting parts that make you never want to get on an airplane or buy a single share of a stock again. Since initial public offerings are often sold out, you have to figure a lot of investors are ignoring the highlighted paragraphs. But in addition to those, there's useful information in a prospectus that shouldn't be overlooked. The initial offering for Sunbelt went off successfully at $8.50 per share. Thanks to the proceeds, the company began its independent life with a strong balance sheet, no debt, and $2 a share in cash. The plan was to use the cash to remodel the best of its 98 lawn and garden centers, thereby improving their profitability and to shut down a few of the duds. These stores had not been remodeled since the Vietnam War, so there was plenty of room for improvement. The most important renovation was enclosing a portion of the nursery space so that plants and flowers could survive in the colder months and wouldn't be left to freeze to death and be reincarnated as mulch. Pier 1 was still the major Sunbelt shareholder with its 49% stake, a factor that I viewed as very favorable. I already knew that Pier 1 knew how to run a retailing business, so it wasn't like an insurance company having a majority interest in a paper company. Moreover, Pier 1 had already done its own remodeling, and I thought Sunbelt could benefit from Pier 1's experience. The management of both operations owned a lot of shares, which gave them substantial incentive to make Sunbelt a success. By the time I got around to considering Sunbelt as a possible Barron selection, the year-end tax selling had dropped the stock price to a tantalizing $5 a share. After a single disappointing quarter, mainly caused by a string of natural lawn and garden calamities, premature frost in Arizona, 14 inches of rain in Texas, Sunbelt had lost a third of its market value. What a bonanza for the investors who had the courage to buy more. This was the same company that had gone public at $8.50 a share two months earlier. It still had the same $2 a share in cash, and its renovation plans were still intact. At $5 a share, Sunbelt was selling for less than its book value of $5.70, and with 1992 earnings estimated at $0.50 to $0.60 cents a share, its P-E ratio was slightly less than 10. This was for a 15% grower. 
Other lawn and garden retail companies were selling at twice book value and had P-E ratios of 20 or higher. One way to estimate the actual worth of a company is to use the home buyer's technique of comparing it to similar properties that have recently been sold in the neighborhood. Multiplying the $5 share price times the number of Sunbelt shares, 6.2 million, I arrived at the conclusion that the market value for the entire company and its 98 lawn and garden centers was $32 million. Normally in this exercise, you have to subtract the debt. But since Sunbelt had no debt, I could ignore this step. Checking other publicly owned nursery companies, I discovered the Callaways, which operates 13 Sunbelt type stores in the Southwest, had 4 million shares outstanding, and stock was selling for $10. That gave Callaways a market value of $40 million. If Callaways with 13 stores was worth $40 million, how could Sunbelt with its 98 stores be worth only $32 million? Even if Callaways was a superior operation that made more money per store than Sunbelt, which it was, Sunbelt had seven times the number of outlets and five times Callaway's total sales. All things being remotely equal, Sunbelt should have been worth as much as $200 million or $30 a share. Or all things not being equal, for instance, if Callaway was overpriced and Sunbelt was a mediocre operation, Sunbelt was still cheap. By the time my Sunbelt tip got into print, the stock had bounced back to six dollars and a half. Though I didn't plan it this way, 1992 was the year that Lynch specialized in greenery. The same way Pier 1 led me to Sunbelt, Sunbelt led me to General Host. You would never guess that General Host had anything to do with greenery. This once was a rather eccentric conglomerate that owned anything and everything, which may explain the name. At one time or another, it had owned Hot Sam's Pretzels and Hickory Farm stores and kiosks and American Salt. It owned All-American Gourmet TV Dinners, Van de Camp's Fish, and Frank's Nurseries and Crafts. It had owned Callaway's Nurseries before Callaway's was spun off in the public stock sale mentioned before. Lately, General Host had divested itself of the pretzels, the salt, the TV dinners, the farm stores, the frozen fish, in order to concentrate on the 280 Frank's Nursery outlets located in 17 states. What impressed me from the outset was that the company had a long-term program to buy back its own shares. Recently, it had bought back some for $10 a share, which tells you that in the company's own expert opinion, general hosts must be worth more than $10 per share. Otherwise, why would it waste all its money on itself? When a company buys back shares that once paid a dividend and borrows the money to do it, it enjoys a double advantage. The interest on the loan is tax deductible, and the company is reducing its outlay for dividend checks, which it had to pay in after-tax dollars. I was impressed by the fact that General Host's stock price had fallen far below the price at which the company had recently bought back shares. When you or I can buy back part of a company for less than the company itself paid, it's a deal worth examining. It's also a good sign when the insiders, top executives, and the directors have paid more than the current price. Insiders are hardly infallible. Those in numerous Texas and New England banks were madly acquiring more shares all the way down. But there are smart people in business who often know what they're doing and aren't inclined to squander their money on a fool's errand. They are also willing to work extra hard to make their own investments pay off. This leads us to Peter's principle number seven. When insiders are buying, it's a good sign, unless they happen to be New England bankers. So in reviewing the latest proxy statement for General Host, I took it as a good sign that Harris J. Ashton, the CEO and owner of Million Shares, had not parted with a single one of them during the recent price drop. Another tempting detail was that the book value of General Host was $9 a share, which exceeded the price of the $7 stock. In other words, the buyer of the stock was getting $9 of assets for $7. This is my idea of money well spent. Whenever book value comes up, I ask myself the same question we all ask about the movies. Is this based on a true story or is it fictional? The book value of any company can be one or the other. To find out which, 
I turn to the balance sheet. Now let's take a closer look at General Host's balance sheet to show how I do my three minute balance sheet drill. Normally there's a right side and a left side to a balance sheet. The right side shows the company's liabilities, that is, how much money it owes. The left side shows the assets, that is, what it owns. The difference between the two sides, all the assets minus all the liabilities, is what belongs to the shareholders. This is called the shareholders' equity. In General Host's and report, shareholders' equity was shown as $148 million. Was this a reliable number? Of the equity, $65 million was cash. So this part certainly is reliable. Cash is cash. Whether the remaining $83 million in equity is a reliable number depends on the nature of the assets. The left side of the balance sheet, which lists the assets, can be a murky proposition. It includes such things as real estate, machinery and other equipment, and inventory, which may or may not be worth what the company claims. A steel plant might be listed at $40 million, but the equipment is outdated and might fetch zero in a garage sale. Or the real estate, carry on the books at original purchase price, may have declined in value, although the reverse is more likely. With a retailer, the merchandise is also counted as an asset, and the reliability of this number depends on the kind of merchandise that it sells. It could be mini skirts that have gone out of style and are now worthless, or it could be white socks that can always attract a buyer. General Host's inventory consisted of trees, flowers, and shrubs, which I assumed had a decent resale value. A company's acquisitions of other companies are reflected in a category called goodwill, also known as intangibles. General Host showed $22 million in this category. The goodwill is the same amount that has been paid for an acquisition above and beyond the book value of the actual assets. Coca-Cola, for instance, is worth far more than the value of its bottling plants, its trucks, and its syrup. If General Host had bought Coca-Cola, it would have to pay billions for the Coca-Cola name, the trademark, and the other intangibles. This part of the purchase price would appear on the balance sheet as goodwill. Of course, General Host is way too small to buy Coca-Cola, but I'm just using this as an example. The balance sheet indicated that it had acquired other businesses in the past. Whether it can ever recover these goodwill expenditures is open to speculation, and in the meantime, it gradually has to write off the goodwill with part of its earnings. I can't be certain that General Host's $22.9 million in goodwill is really worth that much. If half of General Host's total assets consist of goodwill, I would have no confidence in its book value or in its shareholders' equity. As it turns out, $22.9 million in goodwill out of $148 million in total assets is not a troublesome percentage. We can assume, then, that General Host's book value does approximate the $9 per share that it claimed. Turning to the other side of the balance sheet, the liabilities, I found that the company had $167 million in debt to go along with $148 million in equity. This was troublesome. What you want to see on a balance sheet is at least twice as much equity as debt, and the more equity and the less debt, the better. A high debt ratio like this would in some cases be enough to cause me to take the company off the buy list. But there was a mitigating factor. Much of this debt was not due for several years, and it was not owed to banks. In a highly leveraged company, bank debt is dangerous, because if the company runs into problems, the bank will ask for its money back. This can turn a manageable situation into a potentially fatal one. Back on the left side, the assets, I circled merchandise inventory, which always is something to worry about with retailers. You don't want a company to have too much inventory. If it does, it may mean that management is deferring losses by not marking down the unsold items and getting rid of them quickly. When inventories are allowed to build, this overstates a company's earnings. General host inventories had actually decreased from the previous levels. General host also had a hefty accounts payable number, which is okay. It shows that general host is paying its bills slowly, like everyone else in America, and keeping the cash working in its favor until the last minute. In the text of its annual report, general host described 
how it was engaged in a vigorous campaign to cut costs in order to become more competitive and more profitable, like everybody else in America. Although most companies make such claims, the proof is in the SG&A category, selling general and administrative expenses on the income statement. General hosts SG&A expenses were declining, a trend that continued into 1991. It turns out that General Host was taking several steps, both on Earth and also in outer space, to improve its fortunes. On the terrestrial level, the company was adding new scanning devices to automate the checkout system. The record of each transaction would then be beamed up to a satellite and then down to a central computer. This satellite system, when put into place, is expected to keep track of all the sales and all the nurseries to help management know when to restock the poinsettias and whether to transfer, say, some hibiscus bushes from the Fort Lauderdale branch to the Jacksonville branch. In addition, credit card authorizations were being speeded up from 25 seconds per sale to about 3 seconds to make the lines at the cash register move faster and add to customer satisfaction. Following the same course as Sunbelt Nurseries, General Host was planning to enclose a section of each of its Frank's Nurseries outlets to extend the selling season in addition, it was installing Christmas kiosks in shopping malls during the holidays. This wasn't just a harebrained scheme. General Host had experience in the kiosk business from having deployed more than a thousand of them to sell its Hickory Farm products. This is a cheap way for a retailer to add selling space. Already, General Host had installed more than 100 Frank's Nursery kiosks, stocked with gift wrapping, Christmas trees, wreaths and boughs, in shopping malls in 1991, and the company planned to increase the number to 150 kiosks by Christmas 1992. It was also taking steps to enclose the kiosks and make them more permanent. Meanwhile, General Host was opening new Frank's Nursery outlets at a steady and careful pace. The goal was to create 150 new Frank's by 1995, bringing the total to about 430. The company also launched a new private label line of fertilizers and seeds. Every company in existence likes to tell its shareholders that business is going to get better. But what made General Host's claim believable was that management had a plan. The company wasn't waiting for begonia sales to improve. It was taking concrete steps, the kiosks, the remodel nurseries, the satellite system, to boost its earnings. When a business as old-fashioned as Frank's is modernizing on all fronts, and expanding at the same time, there are several chances for earnings to improve. A final reassuring detail was the Callaway's transaction. In 1991, General Host had sold off the Callaway nursery chain in Texas, and it used the proceeds of $18 million to reduce its debt, thus strengthening the balance sheet. Since General Host was now confined to the nursery business, the same as Callaway, the Callaway sale gives us another chance to compare one similar enterprise to another. Once again, I took out my most sophisticated investment tool, a 15-year-old handheld calculator, to do the following math. Callaway's, with 13 stores, was valued at $40 million, or roughly $3 million per store. General Host owned 280 Frank's nursery outlets, or 21 times as many stores as Callaway's. The Frank's outlets were older, smaller and less profitable than Callaway stores, but even if we assume they are half as valuable, or $1.5 million per store, the 280 franc stores ought to be worth $420 million. So General Host had a $420 million asset here. Subtracting the company's $177 million in debt leaves you with an enterprise worth $253 million. With 17.9 million shares outstanding, this means that General Host shares ought to be selling for $14, or nearly twice the price at the time I made the calculation. Clearly, the company was undervalued. Now I'd like to turn to one of my favorite pursuits, finding blossoms in the desert. I'm always on the lookout for great companies in a lousy industry, a great industry that's growing fast such as computers or medical technology, attracts too much attention and too many competitors. As Yogi Berra once said about a famous Miami Beach restaurant, 
It's so popular, no one goes there anymore. When industry gets too popular, nobody makes money there anymore. As a place to invest, I'll take a lousy industry over a great industry anytime. In a lousy industry, one that's growing slowly, if at all, the weak drop out and survivors get a bigger share of the market. A company that can capture an ever-increasing share of a stagnant market is a lot better off than one has to struggle to protect a dwindling share of an exciting market. This leads us to Peter's principle number eight. In business, competition is never as healthy as total domination. The greatest companies in lousy industries share certain characteristics. They are low-cost operators and penny pinchers in the executive suite. They avoid going into debt. They reject the corporate caste system that creates white-collar Brahmins and blue-collar untouchables. Their workers are well-paid and have a stake in the company's future. They find niches, parts of the market that bigger companies have overlooked. They grow fast, faster than many companies in the fashionable, fast-growth industries. Pompous boardrooms, overblown executive salaries, demoralized rank and file, excessive indebtedness, and mediocre performance go hand in hand. This also works in reverse. Modest boardrooms, reasonable executive salaries, and a motivated rank and file, and small debts equal superior performance most of the time. I call John Weiss, an analyst from Montgomery Securities in California, who'd written reports on several discount appliance store chains. I wanted his opinion about the good guys, a stock I'd been following since 1991. Weiss said that competition from Circuit City was hurting the good guys' earnings. When I asked him what else he liked in this lousy industry, he mentioned Sun Television and appliances. Weiss's version on the Sun TV story was so compelling that as soon as I hung up with him, I called the corporate headquarters in Ohio to talk to the source. When you can get the CEO on the line without delay, and you've never met this person, you know the company does not suffer from excessive hierarchy. I was connected to Bob Oyster, an amiable chap. We rhapsodized on the merits of Ohio golf courses before we got around to the purpose of the call. Sun TV is Central Ohio's lone high volume discount outlet for small appliances as well as refrigerators, washers, and dryers. Oyster said there were seven Sun TV stores in Columbus alone. One of the company's most profitable outlets is located in Chillicothe, Ohio, a name that many of my fellow Barron's panelists later congratulated me for being able to pronounce. Trivia buffs and shareholders of Sun TV and appliances will be happy to know that 50% of the U.S. population lives within 500 miles of Columbus. In fact, Columbus is the only major city east of the Mississippi and north of the Mason-Dixon line that increased its population from 1950 to 1990. The population growth in this part of Ohio, the news of which has yet to reach the East Coast, augurs well for the future of Sun TV. The company was engaged in a vigorous expansion program. Seven new stores in 1991, five more in 1992, which would bring the total to 22. It had less than $10 million in debt. With the stock selling for $18, a P ratio was only 15. Here was a 25 to 30% grower with a 15 PE. Several of its competitors were struggling to stay in business. Sun TV made money in the 1990-1991 recession when the economy was terrible, home sales were sluggish, and people weren't buying new appliances. The company's earnings actually increased in 1991. I had no reason to doubt it would do even better in 1992. Nevertheless, Sun TV had a lot to prove before it makes an all-star team of great companies in lousy industries. Here are some of my all-time favorites. I'll start with Bandag. What could be less exciting than a company that makes retread tires in Muscatine, Iowa? I've never been to Muscatine, but I've looked it up on the map. It's a small node on the Mississippi River south of Davenport, Moscow, and at Talisa, and southeast of West Liberty. Whatever is up to date in Kansas City probably hasn't got to Muscatine, which may be to Muscatine's advantage. Wall Street hasn't spent much time in Muscatine either. Only three analysts have followed Bandag on its rise from $2 to $60 a share in 15 years. Bandag's CEO, Martin Carver, returns the favor 
by staying away from New York. He holds the world speed record for diesel truck. You won't see him sipping champagne in the courtyard at Trump's Plaza Hotel. But on the other hand, Carver is solvent. Bandags features earthy management. In the 1988 Annie Report, Carver thanked his family, devoted penny pinching, an unusual niche in what otherwise is a cutthroat business. Every year in the U.S., 12 million worn-out truck and bus tires are replaced with retreads. About 5 million of these replacements are Bandags. Bandag has increased the dividend every year since 1975. Its earnings have grown at a 17% clip since 1977. Its balance sheet is a bit weak, primarily because Bandag has invested in overseas expansions. It now is 10% of the foreign retread market, and has also bought back 2.5 million of its own shares. While the earnings continue to grow, Bandag's stock price dropped sharply in the Great Correction and again in the Saddam sell-off. This overreaction on Wall Street's part was a perfect opportunity to buy more shares. Both times, the stock recovered all of its lost ground and then some. Crown, Cork, and Seal reminds me of New England Wire and Cable, the company Danny DeVito tried to acquire in the movie Other People's Money. The executive suite at New England Wire was a messy room over the factory decorated with muffler shop calendars. The executive suite at Crown, Cork, and Seal amounts to an open loft above the assembly lines. New England Wire made wire. Crown, Cork, and Seal makes soda cans, beer cans, paint cans, pet food containers, jugs for antifreeze, bottle caps, bottle washers, bottle rinsers, bottle crowners, and cam warmers. In both cases, the CEO was a businessman with old-fashioned ideas. The difference is the New England Wire and Cable was about to go bankrupt, whereas Crown, Cork, and Seal is one of the world's most successful companies. I probably don't need to tell you that cans is a lousy industry with thin profit margins, or that Crown, Cork, and Seal is a low-cost producer. Its ratio of expenses to sales is 2.5%, which is more than a couple notches below the industry average of 15%. This piddling level expenditure, bordering on the monastic, was inspired by John Connolly, the CEO who recently died. Connolly's hostility to extravagance brings us to Peter's principle number nine. All else being equal, invest in the company with the fewest color photographs in its annual report. Connolly's annual report had zero photographs. Where he didn't mind spending was on new can-making technologies that enabled Crown Cork and Seal to maintain its status as the lowest cost producer. Profits that weren't reinvested into improving the can-making operation were used to buy back shares. This boosted the earnings for the remaining shares, which boosted the share price for the lucky shareholders who hadn't sold. You would have almost have thought that Mr. Connolly was working for the shareholders, which at many companies is an eccentric thing to do. Since Mr. Connolly's death, the company has changed tactics. It now uses its sizable cash flow to buy out its rivals and grow via that familiar method. Capital spending has increased and so has the debt level, but to date this new tactic has been as profitable as the old one. The price of Crown Cork and Seal moved up from $54 to $92 in 1991. Nobody wants to be in the steel business these days with all the competition from the Japanese and the billions invested in equipment that may soon be outmoded. The big name producers, U.S. Steel, alias USX, and Bethlehem Steel, once symbols of American prowess, have tested their shareholders' patience for decades. Bethlehem fell to $5 a share in 1986, has come back a long way from there, but at the current price of $13, it still has a long way to go to return to its high $32 a share in 1981. USX has also yet to return to its 1981 high. Meanwhile, if you had invested in a steel company called Nucor in 1981, your $6 stock would be worth over $90 in early 1993, and you would think the steel business is a great business after all. 
or if you'd gotten a new core for a dollar a share in 1971, you'd now be convinced that steel is one of the greatest businesses of all time. You wouldn't think so if you had bought Bethlehem for $24 a share in 1971, because now you have $13 a share, the sort of results that give investing in treasury bills a good name. Here again, we have a penurious maverick with a vision. F. Kenneth Iverson was not above taking fancy corporate clients to lunch at Phil's Deli across from corporate headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina. There is no executive dining room at Nucor. There are no limos in the parking lot. There is no corporate jet at the airport. And there are no special privileges for wearing a suit. When profits decline, the people in the suits and the people in the overalls both take home less pay. When profits increase, as they usually do, everybody gets a bonus. Nucor's 5,500 employees don't belong to a union, but they fare better than their colleagues at other steel plants. They share in the profits and they can't be laid off. Their children get college scholarships. If the economy slows down and production is cut, the entire workforce puts in a shorter week. So the suffering and the layoff is shared. Nucor has had two niches in its history. In the 1970s, it specialized in turning scrap metal into construction grade steel. Lately, as other companies have caught on to this process, Nucor has kept a step ahead of them by learning to produce a high grade flat rolled steel. These flat roll sheets can be used for auto bodies and appliances. With this new thin slab casting process, Nucor can now compete directly with the Bethlehems on the US Exus. Savings and loans are the latest untouchables of equities. Mention the term and people grab for their wallets. Yet for the scores of SNLs that have stayed out of trouble or survived it, it still is a wonderful life. Based on equity assets, the most fundamental measure of financial strength, more than 100 savings and loans are stronger today than the nation's strongest bank, J.P. Morgan. The essential point, however, is that many SNLs are in terrific financial shape, which is the opposite of what we've been hearing. There are also plenty of SNLs in lousy financial shape, which is why it's important to make distinctions. There are the bad guys that perpetrated the fraud, the greedy guys that ruined a good thing, and the Jimmy Stewart's, the good guys. Let me tell you about the Jimmy Stewart's savings and loans. Through all the scandals and the headlines, they've been quietly making a profit. These are the no-frills, low-cost operators who take in deposits from the neighborhood are content to make old-fashioned residential mortgage loans. By sticking to its simple function, a Jimmy Stewart SNL can avoid hiring the high-priced loan analysts and other expensive muck and mucks employed by the big banks. Likewise, it can avoid spending money on a Greek temple for the main office, Queen Anne furniture in the lobby, blimps, billboards, celebrity sponsors, and original artwork for the walls. Travel posters will suffice. A money center bank such as Citicorp routinely spends the equivalent of two and a half to three percentage points of its entire loan portfolio just to cover its overhead and related expenses. Therefore, it must make a spread of at least two and a half percent between what it pays for deposits and it receives from its loans in order to break even. A Jimmy Stewart SNL can survive on a much narrower spread. Its break even point is one and a half percent or lower. Theoretically, it could make a profit without making any mortgage loans at all. If it pays 4% in interest to passbook savers, it can invest the proceeds in 6% treasury bonds and still earn money. When it writes 8 or 9% mortgages, it becomes highly profitable for its shareholders. For years, the inspiration for all Jimmy Stewart SNLs has been Golden West, based in Oakland, California. Prior to the 1980s, Golden West was one of the few SNLs that was a public company. Then in a rash of stock offerings in mid-decade, hundreds of formerly private thrifts operating as mutual savings banks went public more or less simultaneously. I acquired many of these for the Magellan Fund. I was so selective in my purchases during this period that anything that had the word first or trust in it, I bought. Once I confessed to the Barron's panel that I invested in 135 of the 145 thrifts 
whose prospectuses had landed on my desk. The experts at SNL Securities in Charlottesville, Virginia, who keep tabs on all thrifts in existence, recently provided me with an update of what happened to 464 SNLs that came public after 1982. 99 of these were subsequently taken over by bigger banks and SNLs, usually a large profit to the shareholders. 65 of the publicly traded SNLs have failed, usually at a total loss to the shareholders. This leaves us 300 still in business. Whenever I get the urge to invest in SNL, I always think of Golden West. But after it doubled in price in 91, I decided to search for better prospects. As I went down the SNL list in preparation for Barron's panel in 1992, I found several. You couldn't have invented a better atmosphere for creating bargains. The SNL fraud story had drifted off the front pages, only to be replaced by the collapse of the housing market story. This had been a popular scare for two years running. The housing market was going to crash and take the banking system down with it. People remembered that when the housing market collapsed in Texas in the early 1980s, several banks and SNLs collapsed in sympathy. And they expected the same fate would befall SNLs in the Northeast and California, where fat cat houses were already suffering a correction. The latest quiet facts put out by the National Association of Home Builders that the median price of a home had increased in 1990 and again in 1991 convinced me that the collapse of the housing market was largely a figment of the fat cat imagination. I knew that the best of the Jimmy Stewart SNLs had a limited involvement in expensive houses, commercial real estate, or construction loans. For the most part, their portfolios were concentrated in $100,000 residential mortgages. They had good earnings growth, a solid base of loyal depositors, and more equity than J.P. Morgan. Yet the virtues of the Jimmy Stewart SNLs were lost in the funk. Wall Street was down in these stocks, and so was the average investor. Fidelity's own select SNL fund had dwindled in size from $66 million in February 1987 to a low of only $3 million in October 1990. Brokerage houses had reduced their coverage of the thrift industry, and some had stopped covering it at all. There were nearly 50 analysts in the country who tracked Walmart, and another 45 to 50 who tracked Philip Morris, but only a few who devote themselves to keeping up with publicly traded SNLs. This leads us to Peter's principle number 10. When even the analysts are bored, it's time to start buying. Intrigued by the cheap prices at which many SNL stocks were selling, I immersed myself in a copy of the Thrift Digest, my idea of the perfect bedside thriller. It's published by SNL Securities and edited by Reed Nagel, who does an outstanding job. The Thrift Digest is as thick as the Boston Metropolitan Telephone Directory, and it costs $700 a year to get the monthly updates. I mention the price so you won't run out and order the thing, only to discover you could have bought two round trip tickets to Hawaii instead. If you decide to pursue the subject of undervalued SNLs, which to me is much more exciting than any trip to Hawaii, you will be well advised to seek out the latest copy of the Thrift Digest at the local library or to borrow one from your broker. I borrowed mine from Fidelity. From it, I devised my own SNL scorecard, listing 145 of the strongest institutions by state and jotting down the following key details. This, in a nutshell, is everything you need to know about an SNL. Current price. This, I think, is self-explanatory. Initial offering price. When a savings loan is selling below the price at which it came public, it's a sign that the stock may be undervalued. Other factors, of course, must be considered. Equity to assets ratio. The most important number of all. It measures financial strength and the survivability. The higher the equity assets, the better. Equity assets have an incredible range from as low as 1 or 2 percent candidates for the scrap heap to as high as 20, three times stronger than J.P. Morgan. An equity assets of 5.5 to 6 is average, but below 5, you're in the danger zone of ailing thrifts. Before I invest in any SNL, 
I like to see that its equity assets is at least 7.5. This is not only for disaster protection, but also because an SNL with a high equity asset ratio becomes an attractive takeover candidate. This excess equity gives it excess lending capacity that a larger bank or SNL might want to put to use. Dividend. Many savings and loans pay better than average dividends. When one of them meets all the other criteria and also has a high yield, it's a plus. Book value. Most of the assets of a bank or an SNL are its loans. Once you assure yourself that an SNL has avoided high risk lending, which we'll cover in a moment, you can begin to have confidence that its book value, as reported in its financial statements, is an accurate reflection of the institution's real worth. A lot of the most profitable Jimmy Stewart's are selling at well below book value today. Price earnings ratio. As with any stock, the lower this number, the better. Some savings and loans with annual growth rates of 15% a year have P ratios of seven or eight based on the prior 12 months earnings. This is very promising, especially in light of the fact that the overall P ratio of the S&P 500 was over 20 when I did this research. High risk real estate assets. These are the common problem areas, especially commercial loans and construction loans that have been the ruination of so many SNLs. When high risk assets exceed five to 10%, I begin to get nervous. All else being equal, I prefer to invest in SNL that has a small percentage of its assets in this high risk category. Since it's impossible for a casual investor to analyze a commercial lending portfolio from afar, the safest course is to avoid investing in SNLs that make such loans. Even without the Thrift Digest, it's possible to do your own calculation of high-risk assets. Check the annual report for the dollar value of all construction and commercial real estate lending listed under assets. Then find the dollar value of all outstanding loans. Divide the latter into the former, and you'll arrive at a good approximation of the high risk percentage. Ninety day non performing assets. These are the loans that have already defaulted. What you want to see here is a very low number, preferably less than two percent of the SNL's total assets. And also, you like this number to be falling and not rising. An extra couple of percentage points worth of bad loans can wipe out an SNL's entire net worth. Real estate owned. This is property on which the SNL's have already foreclosed. The REO category, as it is called, is an index of yesterday's problems because whatever shows up here has been written off as a loss on the books. Since this financial hit has already been taken, a high percentage of real estate owned isn't as worrisome as a high percentage of non-performing assets. But it's worrisome when REO is on the rise. SNLs aren't in the real estate business, and the last thing they want to do is to repossess more condos or office parks that are expensive to maintain and hard to sell. In fact, where there's a lot of REO, you have to assume that the SNL is having trouble getting rid of it. I ended up choosing seven SNLs to recommend in Barron's, which tells you how much I like the group. Five of these were strong Jimmy Stewart type thrifts, and two were long shots. I call these the born agains, which have come back from the edge of Chapter 11. Two of the five strong thrifts, Germantown Savings and Loan, and Glacier National Bank were repeat recommendations from 1991. The five Jimmy Stewart's got excellent marks in several categories. Book value, four of them sold at a discount, equity to assets ratio, all 6% or better, high risk loans under 10%, 90 day delinquencies, 2% or less, real estate owned, less than 1%, and PE ratio below 11. That two of them have been buying back their own shares in recent months was another positive. For Glacier and Germantown, 
The percentage of commercial lending was a bit high, but this was less bothersome after I heard the banker's explanations. With the two born-agains, many of the numbers are quite dismal. Everything a conservative investor should try to avoid. I picked them as long shots because they still maintained high equity to assets ratios in spite of their problems. Having this equity cushion gave them a little leeway to work out their troubles. The region in which those two SNLs do business, near the Massachusetts New Hampshire border, was beginning to show signs of stability. I couldn't guarantee that these born agains would survive, but their stock prices had fallen so low, in the case of Lawrence Savings Bank, from $13 to $0.75, cents, that I knew the bottom fishers would make a lot of money if they did. Dozens of SNLs around the country are as strong or stronger than my top five. You might find one or more of them in your own neighborhood. A lot of investors are going to be very pleased they've concentrated on this group. The Jimmy Stewarts will either continue to prosper on their own or they will be taken over by larger institutions at prices far above the current levels. An SNL with excess equity, excess lending capacity, and a loyal depositor base is a prize that commercial banks covet. Commercial banks can take in deposits only in their home states, although this rule is changing to some degree, but they can lend money anywhere. That is what makes taking over an SNL a very tempting proposition. If I were the Bank of Boston, for instance, I'd be sending love notes to Homeport Bank Corp of Nantucket, Massachusetts. Homeport has a 20% equity to assets ratio, making it perhaps the strongest financial institution in the modern world. It also has a captive island market with crusty New England depositors who aren't about to change their banking habits and run off to a newfangled money market fund. Maybe the Bank of Boston doesn't want to make loans in Nantucket. But once it acquired Homeport's equity and its deposit base, it could use the excess lending capacity to make loans in Boston or anywhere else in the nation. During 1987 to 1990, a terrible period for SNLs, more than 100 were acquired by larger institutions who saw the same sort of potential that the Bank of Boston ought to see in Homeport. Banks and thrifts will continue to consolidate at a rapid rate and with good reason. Currently, the U.S. has more than 7,000 banks, thrifts, and other assorted deposit takers, which is about 6,500 too many. There are six different deposit takers in my little town of Marblehead. That number is about half as many as there is in the entire country of England. Every year since 1986, I've recommended Fannie Mae to the Barron's panel. It's getting to be boring. I touted in 1986 as the best business literally in America, noting that Fannie Mae had a quarter of the employees of Fidelity and 10 times the profits. The stock has been so great, they ought to retire the symbol. Fidelity and its clients made more than a billion dollars in profits on Fannie Mae in the 1980s and early 1990s. I'm submitting this result to the Guinness Book of Records, most money ever made by one group on one stock in the history of finance. Was Fannie Mae an obvious winner? In hindsight, yes, but a company does not tell you when to buy it. There's always something to worry about. There are always respected investors who say that you're wrong. You have to know the story better than they do and have to have faith in what you know. For a stock to do better than expected, the company has to be widely underestimated. Otherwise, it could sell for a higher price to begin with. When the prevailing opinion is more negative than yours, you have to constantly check and recheck the facts to reassure yourself that you're not being foolishly optimistic. The story keeps changing, either for better or for worse. You have to follow these changes and act accordingly. With Fannie Mae Wall Street was ignoring the changes. The old Fannie Mae had made such a powerful impression that people had a hard time seeing the new Fannie Mae emerging in front of their eyes. I saw it, but not right away. Not right away was still soon enough to make a six-fold profit on a $200 million investment. 
Let me give you some of the highlights from my Fannie Mae diary. In 1977, I took my first position in this $5 stock. What did I know about the company? It was founded in 1938 as a government-owned enterprise, and then was privatized in the 1960s. Its function in life was to provide liquidity in the mortgage market, which it accomplished by buying mortgages from banks and SNLs. Its motto was borrow short and lend long. Fannie Mae borrowed money at cheap rates, used the money to buy long-term mortgages that paid higher fixed rates, and pocketed the difference. This strategy worked okay in periods when interest rates were going down. Fannie Mae earned a lot of money during these times because the cost of its borrowings decreased while the proceeds from its portfolio of fixed rate mortgages stayed constant. When interest rates went up, the cost of borrowing increased and Fannie Mae lost a lot of money. I sold the stock a few months after I bought it for a small profit. I saw that interest rates were going up. Four years later in 1981, Fannie Mae had a lot in common with the heroine of the perils of Pauline, who was trying to avert the latest calamity. All the long-term mortgages it had bought in the mid-70s were paying from 8 to 10 percent. Meanwhile, short-term rates had skyrocketed to 18 to 20 percent. You can't get very far by borrowing at 18 to make 9. Investors knew this, which is why the stock, which sold for as much as $9 a share in 74, fell to a historic low of $2. There were rumors the company would go out of business. 1982. Under my nose, Fannie Mae was about to undergo a major personality change. The company we all thought we understood as an interest rate play, losing millions one year, making millions the next, was trying to reinvent itself. A guy named David Maxwell was brought in. Maxwell was a lawyer, a former insurance commissioner of Pennsylvania, who earlier had started his own mortgage insurance company and made a big success of it. He knew the industry. Maxwell was determined to put a stop to Fannie Mae's wild earning swings. He wanted to turn the company into a stable, mature enterprise with reliable earnings. This he hoped to accomplish in two ways. One, by putting an end to borrowing short, lending long, and two, by imitating Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac, formerly known as the Federal Home Mortgage Corporation, also was started by the federal government. Its mission was to purchase mortgages exclusively from savings and loans. Freddie Mac became a publicly traded company in the late 1980s. In addition to simply buying mortgages and holding them, Freddie Mac had stumbled into a newfangled idea of packaging mortgages. The idea was simple. Buy a bunch of mortgages, bundle them together, and sell the bundle to banks, SNLs, insurance companies, colleges or charitable endowments, and so forth. Fannie Mae copied the Freddie Mac idea and began packaging mortgages in 1982. Let's say you had a mortgage on your house that came from Bank X. Bank X would sell your mortgage to Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae would lump it together with other mortgages to create a mortgage-backed security. This packaging service was very popular in banking circles. Before mortgage-backed securities came along, banks and SNLs were stuck with owning thousands of little mortgages. It was hard to keep track of them, and it was hard to sell them in a pinch. Now the banks could sell all their little mortgages to Fannie Mae and use the proceeds to make more mortgages, so the money wasn't tied up. If they still wanted to own mortgages, they could buy a few mortgage-backed securities from the same Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae could sell the mortgage-backed securities to anybody, even back to the banks that had originated the mortgages in the package. Fannie Mae got a nice fee for doing this, and by selling mortgages that it used to hold in its own portfolio, it passed the interest rate risk onto the new buyers. Soon there was a market for the mortgage-backed securities, and they could be traded instantly, like a stock or a bond or a bottle of vodka in Moscow. Mortgages by the thousands 
and later by the millions, were converted into packages. This little invention, if you could even call it that, was destined to become a $300 billion a year industry, bigger than big steel or big coal or big oil. But in 1982, I was still looking at Fannie Mae as an interest rate play. I bought the stock for the second time in my career as interest rates were falling. And the notes I took after calling the company on November 23, 1982, I wrote, I figure they'll make $5 a share. That year, the stock rebounded in typical Fannie Mae fashion from 2 to $9. This is what happens with cyclicals. The company loses money in 1982, and the stock increases fourfold as investors anticipate the next golden age. On to 1983. When I called in February, the company was doing a billion dollars a month in these new mortgage-backed securities. It occurred to me that Fannie Mae was like a bank, but also had a major advantage over bank. Banks had 2 to 3 percent overheads. Fannie Mae could pay its expenses on 2 tenths of 1 percent overhead. It didn't have a blimp. It didn't give away any toaster ovens. It didn't pay Phil Rizzuto to advertise mortgage-backed securities on TV. Its entire payroll was around 1,300 people, spread out into four offices located in four different cities. The Bank of America had as many branches as Fannie Mae had employees. Thanks to its status as a quasi-governmental agency, Fannie Mae could borrow money more cheaply than any bank, more cheaply than IBM or General Motors or thousands of other companies. It could, for instance, borrow money for 15 years at 8%, use the money to buy a 15-year mortgage at 9% and earn a 1% spread. No bank, savings and loan, or other financial company in America could make a profit on a 1% spread. It doesn't sound like much, but a 1% spread on a $100 billion worth of loans is still $1 billion. Now, a lot of analysts were saying good things about Fannie Mae. They saw that further declines in interest rates would, as one of them said, explode the earnings. After eight straight quarters of losses, Fannie Mae actually posted a profit in 1983. The stock went nowhere. By 1984, my commitment to the stock was a whopping one-tenth of one percent of Magellan's assets. But even a small position enabled me to keep in touch. I increased it gingerly a little over a third of 1% by the end of the year. The stock fell in half again, from $9 to 4 and typical old Fannie Mae style, interest rates rose and earnings fell. The benefits of mortgage-backed securities were still outweighed by Fannie Mae's portfolio of long-term mortgages acquired in the mid-1970s at unfavorable rates. But the company continued to chip away at this block of granite. Finally, in 1985, the potential of this company was beginning to dawn on me. Mortgage-backed securities could be a huge industry. Fannie Mae was now packaging $23 billion worth of these a year, twice the number in 1983-1984. Big pieces of that block of granite were being chipped away. Management now talked about the old portfolio and the new portfolio. There were two different businesses here packaging mortgages and selling them, and originating mortgages and holding on to them. A new fear crept in, not interest rates, but Texas. Crazy SNLs down there have been lending money in the oil patch boom. People in Houston who'd gotten mortgages with 5% down were leaving the keys in the door and walking away from their houses and their mortgages. Fannie Mae owned a lot of these mortgages. In May, I visited the company in Washington and spoke to the chairman, David Maxwell. Several important competitors in the mortgage business had dropped out. With fewer competitors buying and selling mortgages, the profit margins on loans had widened. This would greatly boost Fannie Mae's earnings. I must have been impressed with Fannie Mae's progress. I bought more stock, enough to make Fannie Mae 2% of the fund, one of my top 10 holdings. Here's the key question to ask about a risky yet promising stock. If things go right, how much can I make? Where's the reward side of the equation? I figured that if Fannie Mae could pay for its overhead 
on the proceeds from mortgage-backed securities and then make 1% on its $100 billion portfolio, it could earn $7 a share. At 1985 prices, that gave the stock a P-E ratio of 1. When a company can earn back the price of its stock in one year, you found yourself an incredible deal. Fannie Mae lost 87 cents a share in 1984, but made 52 cents in 1985. The stock rebounded from 4 to $9. In 1986, I retreated a bit. Now only 1.8% of the fund was invested in Fannie Mae. Wall Street was still worrying about Texas and the keys and the doors. Here in my notes on May 19th is a more important development. Fannie Mae had just sold $10 billion of its block of granite, and only $30 billion worth of these unfavorable loans remained. For the first time, I told myself, this stock is a buy on the mortgage-backed securities business alone. Another new card that turned up. Fannie Mae was tightening its lending standards on new mortgages. This turned out to be a very smart move because it protected Fannie Mae in the next recession. In the last five months of 1986, the stock rose from $8 to $12. The company earned $1.44 for the year. 1987. Between 2 and 2.3 percent of Magellan was invested in Fannie Mae throughout the year. The stock seesawed from 12 to 16, back to 12, back to 16, then suffered a setback to $8 in the great correction of October. Wiggle watchers were befuddled. I'm getting ahead of myself. In February, I talked to four Fannie Mae executives on a conference call. I learned that foreclosures on houses with Fannie Mae mortgages were still on the rise. Fannie Mae had become the largest real estate mogul in Texas, literally by default. The company had to spend millions on foreclosure actions and millions more to cut the grass and paint the stoops and otherwise maintain the abandoned houses until buyers could be found. At the moment, buyers were scarce. In my mind, these negatives were overshadowed by the amazing success of mortgage-backed securities. $100 billion worth packaged in a single year. Also, Fannie Mae had solved the problems of ups and downs. It no longer qualifies as a cyclical. It's beginning to resemble Bristol-Myers or General Electric, a steady grower with predictable earnings. But its earnings were growing much faster than Bristol-Myers. Its earnings had jumped from $0.83 cents to $1.55. Along with the rest of the stocks, Fannie Mae got clobbered on October the 19th, 1987. Investors were panicky, and commentators predicted the end of the world. I was comforted by the fact that whereas Fannie Mae's foreclosure rate was still rising, its 90-day delinquencies were falling. Since delinquencies lead to foreclosures, this fall in delinquency rate suggested that Fannie Mae had already seen the worst. I reminded myself of the even bigger picture, that stocks and good companies are always worth owning. I was convinced that Fannie Mae was a good company. What was the worst thing that could happen? A recession that turned into a depression. In that situation, interest rates would drop and Fannie Mae would benefit by calling in its debt and refinancing at lower rates. As long as people were paying on their mortgages, Fannie Mae would be the most lucrative business left on the planet. As the end of the world approached and people stopped paying on their mortgages, Fannie Mae would go down with the banking system and all other systems. But it wouldn't happen overnight. The last thing people would give up, except in Houston apparently, would be their houses. I couldn't imagine a better place to be invested in the twilight of civilization than Fannie Mae's stock. Fannie Mae must have agreed with me. In the aftermath of the Great Correction, the company announced it was buying back up to five million of its own shares. On to 1988. I boosted Magellan's holding to 3% throughout most of the year. Fannie Mae earned $2.14, up from $1.55. Fannie Mae's foreclosures had dropped for the first time since 1984. Wow. In addition, the government had new accounting rules on the mortgage business. Heretofore, mortgage commitment fees were booked as income as soon as Fannie Mae received them. 
the company might receive $100 million in fees one quarter and $10 million the next. This accounting system caused severe fluctuations in Fannie Mae's quarterly earnings. It was not uncommon for Fannie Mae to report a down quarter, which would scare investors and create a sell-off in the stock. Under the new rules, commitment fees had to be amortized over the life of each mortgage loan. Fannie Mae has not suffered a down quarter since these rules went into effect. 1989. I noted the great investor Warren Buffett owned 2.2 million shares. I talked to the company several times. July showed a major improvement in non-performing assets. Miracle of miracles. Housing prices were on the rise in Houston. From the National Delinquency Survey, my latest bedside entertainment, I learned that Fannie Mae's 90-day delinquency rate had dropped again. From 1.1% in 1988 to 6 tenths of a percent in 1989. I also checked the price of median houses statistic to reassure myself that home prices weren't collapsing. They weren't. In fact, they were rising as usual. This was the year I backed up the truck. That's a technical Wall Street term for buying as many shares as you can afford. Toward the end of the year, I reached Magellan's 5% limit. It was my largest position by far. Fannie Mae was now packaging $225 billion worth of new mortgage-backed securities. It would now earn $400 million a year from a packaging business that didn't exist in 1981. Not an SNL in the universe wanted to own a mortgage now. They shipped them all off to Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae. Finally, Wall Street was catching on to the idea that this company can continue to grow at a 15 to 20 percent rate. The stock rose from 16 to 42 dollars a two-and-a-half bagger in one year. As so often happens in the stock market, several years' worth of patience is rewarded in one. Even at this higher price, Fannie Mae was still undervalued with a P.E. of 10. If it weren't for the housing fear that refused to die, Fannie Mae would have been a $100 stock. Now 1990. After I retired from running Fidelity Magellan in May, I continued to keep an interest in Fannie Mae. In the summer and fall, I watched with fascination as more weekend worrying sank this stock just when everything in the company was going right. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, and we were sending troops to Saudi Arabia. The worry this time was that the Gulf War would produce a national depression in real estate, a coast-to-coast -coast version of the Texas calamity. Fannie Mae would become the nation's landlord wasting all its billions on paint, for sale signs, and lawyer's bills. Never in all my years of seeing worthy companies get clobbered for no good reason had I seen one that deserved it less. Fannie Mae's delinquencies problems were now minuscule, but still suffered from fear by association. What a pity for the shareholders who paid attention to the big global picture instead of the goings-on at the company and sold their shares because of the coming depression in housing. Except for the fat cat houses, there was no coming depression in housing. The National Association of Realtors subsequently reported that in 1990 and again in 1991, the price of the average house increased in value. If you had kept up with the story, you knew that Fannie Mae was kept by regulation from making loans of over $200,000, so it wasn't involved in the trophy house market. You knew it had tightened its underwriting standards, no longer made Texas-style loans of 5% down. You knew that the mortgage-backed securities business was still growing at a fast clip. Fannie Mae's stock fell from $42 to $24 in the Saddam sell-off, and then promptly rose again to $38. 1991. I was gone from Magellan. It was up to my successor, Morris Smith, to keep tabs on Fannie Mae. He did, and the stock remained the number one holding. The price rose again from $38 to $60. The company had recorded earnings of $1.1 billion. 1992. For the sixth year in a row, I recommended Fannie Mae and Barron's. The stock was selling for $65 and earning $6, giving it a P.E. ratio of 11, which compared very favorably with the market's P.E. of 23. The company was still a 12 to 15% grower and still undervalued. 
just as they had been for the past eight years. Some things never change. There are plenty of other wonderful stocks among my Barron's picks that I'd love to document for you. Restaurant stocks, utilities, mutual fund companies, but alas, our time grows short. I want to conclude this program with a recommended procedure that I consider vital to any stock picker, the six-month checkup. A healthy portfolio requires a regular checkup. Even with the blue chips, the big names, the top companies in the Fortune 500, the buy and forget it strategy can be unproductive and downright dangerous. The six month checkup is not simply a matter of looking up the stock price in the newspaper, an exercise that often passes in Wall Street for research. As a stock picker, you can't assume anything. You've got to follow the fundamentals of the story. You're trying to get answers to two basic questions. One, is the stock still attractively priced relative to earnings? Two, What's happening in the company to make the earnings go up? Here you can reach one of three conclusions. The story may have gotten better, in which case you might want to increase your investment. The story may have gotten worse, in which case you can decrease your investment. Or the story's unchanged, in which case you can either stick with your investment or put the money into another company with more exciting prospects. With this in mind in July of 1992, I did a six months checkup of all the selections I made in Barron's in January. As a group, these stocks had performed extremely well in a so-so market. The portfolio had increased in value by 19.2%, while the S&P 500 had returned only 1.64%. Incidentally, I've adjusted all these numbers, for various stock splits, special dividends, and so forth that were declared in the six month period. I read the latest quarterly reports from the various companies and I called most of them. Some stories had gone flat, while others were more exciting than before. And in a few cases, my research led me to other companies that I liked better than the ones I had recommended. That's how it is with stocks. It's a fluid situation where nothing is absolutely certain. To give you a sense of this process, I'll give you the checkup details on a few of the stocks we've discussed earlier in this tape. I'll start with the body shop. Back in January 1992, I determined that the body shop was a wonderful company, but overpriced relative to current earnings. I was looking for a drop in price as a chance to buy more. It didn't take long to get one. By July, the stock had fallen about 20%. The body shop was now selling for 20 times the estimated 1993 earnings. I don't mind paying 20 times earnings in a company it's growing at 25% annual rate. As I record these words, the entire New York Stock Exchange is selling at about 20 times earnings. For companies that on average are growing at 8 to 10% a year at best. The body shop is a British stock. British stocks have had a terrible beating in recent months, and the body shop has gotten some bad publicity. A chieftain from the Kayapo Indian tribe that the body shop had hired to produce Brazil nut hair conditioner was arrested in London and charged with raping the Portuguese nanny for some of his numerous children. No matter how hard you try to imagine the next event that will make trouble for company, it usually is something that you hadn't thought of. Checking the price history of this stock, I noticed it had suffered two major setbacks, one in 1987 and the other in 1990, and both in spite of the fact that the company was perking along with no sign of let-up. I attribute these exaggerated sell-offs to the fact that British shareholders are not as familiar with small growth companies as we are, and therefore abandon them more readily in a market crisis. Even if you bought shares in the body shop after the 1990 setback, you had to be prepared for further declines when you might consider buying more. But the fundamentals still had to be favorable, which was the point of the checkup. I called the company. Jeremy Kett, chief financial officer, told me that same store sales and earnings had both increased in 1991, a considerable achievement given the fact that the body shop's four major markets are England, Australia, and Canada, and the United States, all countries struggling with recession. 
another promising card had turned over. The company was using some of its cash to buy up suppliers of various potions and lotions. This would cut the cost of merchandise down the line and improve the profit margin. The market for lotions, potions, and bath oils is still vast, with plenty of room to grow. The body shop was sticking to its expansion plan. 40 new outlets in the U.S. in 93, 50 more in 94, 50 per year in Europe, and an equal number in the Far East. I placed the company in the attractive midlife phase, the second decade of 30 years of growth. In the last quarter of 1992, I had even a better opportunity to buy Body Shop. As the UK economy continued to slip, their earnings finally slipped again, and they had reported down earnings. This brought the stock down by another one-third and brought it to a point where it was selling at less than 15 times expected 1993 earnings, what I regard as a bargain for a company with superior growth prospects. Pier 1 Imports had made a nice run from $8 to 9 50 then promptly reverted. This is an example of Wall Street being deaf to good news. The analyst had pegged Pier 1's first quarter earnings at 18 to 20 cents. Pier 1 had actually earned 17 cents and the stock had clobbered. The company was expected to earn 60 to 70 cents for the year and this was in a wallet-hugging environment. Pier 1 had strengthened the balance sheet by selling $75 million worth of convertible debentures and using the proceeds to retire debt. Long-term debt, which was already been reduced, was pared down even further. Pier 1 had cut debt, reduced inventory, and continued to expand. Its major competitors, the department stores, were getting out of the business of selling home furnishings. The longer this recession lasted, the more competitors would drop by the wayside. When the recovery comes, Pier 1 may have a virtual monopoly on wicker side tables, Scandinavian place settings, and oriental room dividers. It didn't take much wishful thinking to see Pier 1 Imports earning 80 cents a share from its own stores, plus an additional 10 to 15 cents from a revived and dried off Sunbelt Nurseries, a company in which Pier 1 continues to hold a substantial stake. That's a buck a share, which, given a modest P-E ratio of 14, makes Pier 1 Imports a $14 stock. In addition to looking at the companies I had recommended earlier in 1992, I reconsidered some of the companies I had looked at and cast aside. One of those was Cedar Fair. What stopped me from recommending Cedar Fair at the beginning of 1992 was that I couldn't see how the company was going to boost its earnings. In June of 1992, they announced an acquisition of Dorney Park. Cedar Fair will take over Dorney Park add new rides, use the proven Cedar Fair techniques to attract more customers and cut costs. Whereas four to five million people live within driving distance of Cedar Point on Lake Erie, 20 million can reach Dorney Park in less than two hours. The Cedar Fair people aren't exactly acquisition happy. This is the, only the second time they had made an acquisition in 20 years. The math looked very favorable. The purchase price for Dorney was $48 million. Since Dorney earned nearly $4 million in the prior year, the P in the acquisition was about 12. Cedar Fair was not paying for this all in cash. It was paying $27 million in cash, financed by debt, and the balance in 1 million shares of Cedar Fair stock to be given to the owners of Dorney Park. So what happened when the Dorney Park purchase was announced? Cedar Fair's stock did not budge for several weeks. You don't have to be an insider to get in on this deal. You can read about it in the newspapers. Take your time analyzing the situation and still have bought Cedar Fair at an attractive pre-deal price. People who understand the company and followed its fundamentals would realize this was a tremendous, fabulous, outstanding deal, a fundamental change in the story. They had the opportunity to buy the stock at $19 and within six months the stock had risen to 29 which brings us to General Host and Sunbelt Nurseries. General Host is another stock that rose up and then drifted back to just above where I recommended it. Nimble sellers had gotten a 30% gain while long-term investors saw paper profits dwindle from $2 a share to $1.50. In 
to about 50 cents. A disappointing card had turned over. In April, the company issued $65 million worth of a new convertible preferred with an 8% yield. This was exactly what Pier 1 had done, except that General Host had to pay a higher interest rate due to its shakier financial condition. Shareholders in convertible stocks or debentures have the right to trade these in for shares of common stock at a fixed price sometime in the future. This creates more shares of common, which dilutes the earnings for the existing shareholders of the common. Earlier, General Host had bought back some of its common shares, which is a positive move. Now it had reversed itself by issuing the convertible, which was a negative move. Whereas Pier 1 had used the proceeds from its convertible sale to pay off debt, thus reducing interest expense, General Host was using its proceeds to further renovate and expand its Frank's nursery stores. This was a chancier proposition with no immediate benefit. Meanwhile, sales at Frank's nurseries were sluggish to moribund as the revival in housing had begun to fizzle and weather had been poor. Back in January, when the stock was selling for $7.75, the stock was expected to earn $0.60 cents for the year. And now it was an $8 stock and a company that was expected to earn less than $0.40. Cents. Still, General Host had a strong cash flow. Its dividend had been raised for the 14th year in a row, and the stock was selling for less than book value, and the expansion was proceeding according to plan. From punching up GH on my Quotron, I learned that Mario Gabelli had bought a million shares for his value-oriented fund. I counted this stock as a hold. Sunbelt, my other recommendation from the nursery, had lost money since January. More rain in the southwest, where Sunbelt is located, had dampened people's enthusiasm for working in the garden. What had been an $8.5 stock in the initial public offering in 1991 was now a $4.5 stock. And this for a capable company with $1.50 a share in cash. If you bought Sunbelt in mid-1992, you were getting all the garden outlets for $3, and someday when the rains abate and people rediscover flowers, they will have a sunnier disposition towards Sunbelt shares as well. What keeps me from backing up the truck and buying more Sunbelt is Callaway's. You may recall that Callaway's was regarded as the class of the industry, which I hadn't recommended in the first round, because Sunbelt was much cheaper. While checking up on Sunbelt, I discovered that Callaway stock also had fallen in half due to the rain. To find out more, I called Callaway's and talked to Dan Reynolds, the investment relations person. He told me there were 20 employees in the administrative office, all of them sharing the same 3,000 square feet of floor space. I could hear them in the background. Obviously, there's no communications gap in this company. To get management's attention, all you have to do is stand up and yell. Callaway had 13 nurseries plus 50 cents a share in cash and was expected to earn 50 cents in 1992. That gave the stock a P-E ratio of 10. Callaway had very few followers on Wall Street and the company was buying back its own shares. When the best company in industry is selling at a bargain price, it often pays to buy that one as opposed to investing in a lesser competitor that may be selling at a lower price. I'd rather have owned Toys R Us than Child's World, Home Depot than Scotty's, or Nucor than Bethlehem Steel. I still like Sunbelt, but at this point, I think I like Callaway a little bit better. I hope this gives you a decent grasp of what I mean by a six-month checkup. Incidentally, the best performers of my 21 Barron's picks were the SNLs. This was no accident. Take the industry that's surrounded with the most gloom and doom, and if the fundamentals are positive, you'll find some big winners. With interest rates falling, it was a happy year in general for financial institutions. They were making huge earnings thanks to the spread between interest rates they charge for mortgage loans and the rates they pay on savings accounts and CDs. At the one-year checkup, as of mid-1993, despite two stocks falling over 40%, the overall portfolio of 21 stocks had a total return of over 35%, with the S&P 500 up slightly over 5%. But it's time to bring this exercise full circle. I've waded through all the details, mostly to make some very basic points, which I will repeat now and leave you to your own devices.
If you want to have more money tomorrow than you have today, there's one place to put a chunk of your assets that will surely do that for you. The one place is in stocks. If you want those stocks to make money for you, your best bet is to adopt a regular routine of investing and to follow it no matter what. You'll further minimize your risk if you buy stocks and companies that you know something about and can understand. And when most investors are scared into selling, by the end of the world, or the onslaught of war, or the breaking out of peace, or the score of the second game of the World Series, or whatever, that's your cue to do your homework, ignore the news, and buy some more good stocks. <laughs>